All right, we're on the record, CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. The state's continuing with its case in chief. Is the state ready to continue with the examination of your witness this morning? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. The court would note the prosecution is present, the defense counsel as well as the defendant are all present. So at this time, uh, Mr. Bailiff, if we could please have the jurors brought in. Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, good morning, everyone. We are on the record on case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. The state is continuing with presenting evidence in its case in chief. Court notes all the jurors are here properly seated and accounted for. I understand they've all signed their juror affirmation today. Is that correct, Mr. Bailiff? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you for that confirmation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, again, for your continued service and your continued compliance with the court's admonishment each evening when we break. The parties in the court appreciate it very much. At this time, then, uh, the state was conducting direct examination of Dr. Angie Christensen, who has returned to the stand today. I'll remind you, Dr. Christensen, you're still under oath for your testimony. With that in mind, Ms. Smith, if you'd like to continue with your direct examination, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let me uh, return just briefly to item 16, if I may. Um, yesterday when we were, um, during your testimony, you mentioned that there were multiple um, sharp uh, deficits in item 16. Do you recall? Yes. And I could not remember whether we had identified those um, for the jurors. So if you could, please take a look at State's Exhibit 181C. And if you could, we, there should be a pointer up there. Um, I believe you had said there were five indications of sharp trauma in um, this part of the pelvis bone. Do I have that right? Correct, yes. Okay. Could you identify those for the jurors, please? So the one that I identified as number one is here. This one is alteration number two. Number three here is actually visible on both sides of this anomenate. So the one indicated by three is the same alteration, which is visible from both sides. And the same for number four. This is number four from one side of the bone, which can also be observed on the other side. And alteration number five is here. Okay. Now, you said inanimate. In Did I say that right? Inanimate. It's the yes. same as the hip bone. Okay. Um, and so, um, and this is which side of the hip again? This is the left side. Okay. Um, and in identifying these various sharp um, items, you had indicated that s some of these appeared inconsistent with dismemberment. Did, do I remember that correctly? Yes, the, the general location of these sharp alterations in the pelvic region is inconsistent with, with what's typically seen in cases of dismemberment. Okay, in this particular bone? Well, in, in these particular locations on the bone. Okay, um, and so you did receive a lot of bones that were apart, correct? Yes, many of the bones I received were disarticulated or separated from one, on, one another and also fragmentary or okay. in multiple pieces. Okay, but this particular bone um, has some areas where some of the marks are inconsistent with dismemberment. Inconsistent with what's typically seen in cases of dismemberment, yes, that okay. I've observed or read about in case studies. Okay. The other bones that you examined, did you examine um, vertebra? Yes. Okay. And when you examined vertebra, did you see evidence um, that is consistent? Did you see any evidence of sharp um, trauma to the vertebra? I did not see any sharp alterations on the vertebrae. Okay. But my recollection is that many of the vertebrae were either thermally altered or fragmentary and damaged. So I can't exclude the possibility that sharp trauma was present and subsequently destroyed or not visible. Okay. 
and I believe a little later we'll see some pictures of that, but I wanted to kind of put that in context for us. Um, and so you saw lots of different bones, um, and you can't comment on what was on the bones that had extensive thermal damage. The ones that were thermally damaged are, for the most part, highly fragmentary, and I didn't observe any sharp traumas on those bones. Okay. Doesn't mean they weren't there. It just means you didn't observe any. I, I can't say one way or the other. I can't exclude the possibility. But of the material that I did examine, I did not find sharp alterations on those other bones other than these three. Okay. And when you say these three, this is the first item we've talked about, item 16? Yes, the left and right anominate and the sacrum. Okay. And item 16 is the left? Correct. All right. Um, this remains item 16. It is dates exhibit 181E. Are these close-ups of those um, sharp trauma items you've discussed? Yes, these are close-up views of several of the same sharp alterations in the previous photographs. Okay. And um, in, in um, your report, I believe you used the word puncture. Is that correct? Um, I don't recall the exact language I used in my report. Um, okay. If you would like me to refer to my report, I can do that. Um, no, I, I think that's okay. I just want to make sure I understood. When you say sharp alterations, it is not your job to say what instrument caused those. That's correct, yes. Okay. Now, you indicated three items. Let's take a look at state's item uh, 19. It's 181F, or your item 19. Do you recognize that? Yes. What's that? This is the right innominate or right hip bone annotated with arrows indicating sharp alterations. Okay. And how many sharp alterations were in the right hip bone? There were six on the right hip bone. Okay. Um, and um, could you identify those for the jurors just so it's clear? Sure. Five of the six are depicted in these photographs, number one being here, um, two not visible in either of these two views, um, three and four, and five, which again is visible from both views and so indicated on both images, and alteration number six. Okay. And um, now are these items consistent with other situations of dismemberment um, trauma, um, dismemberment trauma, or inconsistent? The, the location of these sharp alterations is not consistent with what I've previously observed in dismemberment cases. Okay. And if I could to orient us, let's take a look back at 182B. Um, just so that I understand what you mean, again, by hip bone, um, I put up uh, 182B. Could you take a look at us and um, show us again the, that right hip bone? This is the right hip bone. Okay. So um, sometimes I think of the hip bone sort of like, you know, when I'm carrying a baby, they're on my hip. So I think of it as that edge. Is that what you refer to as just the edge? Yes. So that edge that you're talking about is called the iliac crest, and it's the part of the hip bone at the top at top side of the hip bone. Okay. And so, but the entire hip bone extends down, correct? Yes. So the edge is what a lot of us think of is what you would call the iliac crest? Yes. All right. But then the entire surface extends down into the pelvis. Correct. All right. And so the items that you've identified and you pointed to it on States Exhibit 182B, um, that area of the pelvis is where again? Um, if you could show us. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? No problem. That area of the low, lower pubis area is where? That is located here. Okay. And in that area, did you see evidence of sharp trauma? Um, I believe we did. Um, discuss one sharp trauma on the left hip okay. bone yesterday. Okay. And so when you're saying hip bone, you mean that the entire bone that kind of curves like a C? Yes. The hip bone encompasses this entire portion here. Okay. Let, let's take a look at States Exhibit 181F, which is another view of your item 19, which again is that right hip bone. Is that right? Yes, but this 
I think this may be the same one that we just looked at. Oh, I apologize. Five of the six. Okay. And you've identified all of those, correct? Correct. All right. Did you also take the radiograph um, ex and the x-rays of this one? Yes. Okay. Let me show you 181G. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, do you want me to zoom in if I can or no? I'm going to ask you to identify them on the radiograph. Okay. I think I can do that from this okay. view. Um, can you please identify the items you've discussed and identified in the, the larger picture? The sharp traumas? Yes, yes. ma'am. So sharp trauma number one, or what I've identified as number one, is here. Number two is here. Um, three and four. Five, again, visible in both views and labeled on both views. And number six. Okay. And number six is in a regular color photo, correct? Yes, number six is what's depicted in the photograph above. Okay. And those are all evidence of sharp trauma to that area? Yes. Um, and this area, and it, it may be just my view, so forgive me if I'm, I'm not oriented correctly, which area um, is sharp trauma number one in? Is it towards the top of the hip bone or towards the bottom of, uh, sort of lower in the hip bone? Number one is in the pubic region. Okay. And number two would be where? Number two is in a region called the ischial region. It's basically, um, if you would like to show the, um, the photograph of the bone, it might be easier for me to point it out there. Do you want the diagram or the? Sure, the diagram. Sure. So the ischium is basically this part um, right back here. So it's it's toward the it's sort of the part of your hip that you're sitting on. Okay. All right. All right. Now you indicated there was a third bone. Is that documented in your items, the images of item six, uh, 17, yes, where sir. we found the additional sharp trauma? I believe that was item 17. 17, thank you. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? These are photographs taken as part of my examination. Okay. Of what particular item? Uh, this is the... Can you move it down just a little bit? Oh, absolutely. So I'm sorry. It's hard for yep. me to tell what, nope, you, what is okay. visible. Um, this is I, the item 17 sacrum, which in these images here are still attached to several of the lumbar vertebrae. And um, did you identify any sharp trauma in this area? Yes, there was one sharp alteration on the left side, which is indicated here, annotated number one. And looking at the whole bone, that's approximately this location here. Okay. Um, and that is the sacrum? That's the sacrum, yes. Okay. Let me show you just for orient, um, to orient us again, is States Exhibit 182A. Where is the sacrum in relation to the pelvis that you've shown us? The sacrum makes up the back of the pelvis and the bottom of the spinal column. Okay. So is it that item that appears to kind of be in the between the two hip bones? Yes. Okay. And that area towards the bottom is where you saw evidence of sharp trauma. It's not toward the bottom, actually. It's oh, if you bring back sure. the diagram, I can. Sure. That sharp trauma on the sacrum was approximately here. And did that sharp trauma appear? Um, in any way sort of in line or near any other sharp trauma you saw? There were sharp traumas on the left hip bone that were in that general area. Okay. And let me show you um, an image um, which appears to be an x-ray of item 17, which is states 181i. Do you recognize that? Yes. Sorry, it's hard to orient. There we go. Um, and again, uh, this is what area of the body? 
This is the sacrum and four of the lumbar vertebrae. Okay. And in this view, in the x-ray view, could you see any evidence of sharp trauma? No. Okay. And so the images of the sacrum that we previously saw had some evidence of sharp trauma? Yes. It's just that it's not very easily visible in a radiograph like this. Okay. Thank you. One moment, please. Let me check with the team. The state has nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, who will be doing cross-examination? I will, Judge. All right. Mr. Thomas, you may conduct your cross. <clears throat> Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, how these uh, the injuries that were on this particular case were not consistent with what you would normally see in a dismemberment type case, right? That's correct. And I'm let's just let's just go there how, how many dismemberment cases do you think that you've done over your career a handful a handful more than 10 probably fewer than 10 fewer than 10 okay so what what makes uh, i guess i don't i don't understand what makes what's a typical dismemberment type case well, in addition to my own case experience, I also am constantly reading the forensic literature and I've read a number of case studies and reports and research papers related to dismemberment cases. Um, typically, the purpose of dismemberment is to disarticulate the body into smaller portions, and that is usually accomplished by cutting around joints, which is not what I observed in this case. And what what kind of... Uh, so you... You're not the tool mark expert, right? That goes to somebody else. Correct. I think you said that earlier. Yes. Okay. And so your job is to decide which bones were were human and which ones were not human. Is that kind of what your job was on this particular case? So I, in this case, um, the material was all, everything that I observed was human in origin. And I was asked to identify any signs of potential trauma on the skeletal remains. In my laboratory, our procedure, if there are um, traumas that may have been um, imparted by a tool, that those are additionally and further examined by our firearms and tool marks unit. Okay. So everything that was sent to you, you knew were already human, human bones? They were identified to me as being human remains, but as part of my examination, I did determine that they were human in origin. Or in some cases, some of the bones, <clears throat> excuse me, were so fragmentary that I wasn't able to conclude that they were definitively human. Okay. But your main job were, was to decide uh, sharp trauma versus other types of trauma on the bones? To I identify and differentiate any trauma to determine what its potential source was and as a means of um, narrowing down which bones might be um, examined by other units. Okay. And so there was a lot of uh, questioning and direction towards uh, the hip area and the pelvic bone. Um, the top of the femur uh, comes up into a, a ball, right, where the, where the hip meets the femur? Correct, yes. Okay. And so some of the trauma was around the pelvic region in that, particular area of the hip joint, right? 
Um, it was mostly on, most of the sharp traumas were on what's called the ilium, which is that big blade-like part of the pelvic bone. Okay. Well, some of the trauma uh, was on the uh, near, near within inches of the uh, ball joint of the, the femur, right? Um, I would have to look at the images again, but I don't think any of them were directly on that socket or that joint area. Right, not on that socket, but near that socket. I mean, none of it is very far from that socket, uh, depending because of the size of the bone. But yes, some of them were in that general neighborhood. I didn't measure the distance from the socket. Okay, so when someone is, look, uh, so when someone is trying to dismember a body, um, what is your understanding of? Uh, in, in your past cases, what is your understanding of uh, how that's done? Is it generally, I, let me withdraw that question. In this particular case, what types of instruments do you think were used based on your professional experience, based on your training, based on your uh, 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 research and, and your review of, of other articles? What types of instruments do you think were used on this particular case? This is not within the scope of my examinations. This is the toolmark examiners. Okay. So your your job was just to define or just to say, yes, this was some sort of trauma, and that then you move it on to somebody else to, to decide which type of trauma. Yes. Okay. All right. And how long did you uh, review these bones? I mean, like, I guess I don't know how long it takes to to take these bones, view them. Um, do CT scans. How long was your particular uh, job here? I, I don't recall, but if you ref if you look at my examination notes, each page is dated. So my examination started on the date of the first page of my examination notes and ended on the date of my um, final report. And do you have those examination notes with you? I, I, I provided them to the prosecution when I walked in today, but I don't have them in front of me. Okay, so if we got them in front of you, you'd be able to tell us? Yes. All right, let's do that. All right, Mr. Baird, if you please provide those to the witness. Thank you. So in this case, I began my examination on August 23 of 2020 and completed my final report on September 22, 2020. Okay. And was this the only case you worked on during the time between August 3rd and, uh, and September 20? I don't recall, but generally I'm only working one case at a time. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Does the state have any redirect? Very briefly, Judge. Very well. Does the witness still have those case notes? Okay. Let's have those returned, please. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, doctor, just a quick question. Defense counsel asked you, you can't tell what type of implement, what actual instrument caused the traumas you observed, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, however, you have used the phrase um, sharp trauma. Yes. Why do you, if you can't tell the specific tool, how do you determine it was actually caused by sharp trauma? So because sharp trauma refers to trauma that was um, imparted with an object with a very small surface area. And this can be differentiated from blunt trauma, which is trauma imparted by an object with a relatively large surface area. And projectile trauma, which is imparted by an object moving at a very high rate of speed with a, low, with a small surface area. Okay. And when you say small surface area, is that because of the size and shape of the trauma you saw inflicted on Tylee's bones? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. That will conclude then the testimony of this witness. Is the witness allowed to be released from any subpoena? The state would ask that she has stopped. That we have no objection. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So thank you again for your testimony. You are excused and the bailiff will assist you out of the courtroom. Thank you. You're welcome.
All right, I take it, Ms. Rawlings, you'll be calling the next witness? Very well. Who is the witness? Very well. We'll have them brought in and sworn. All right, now that the witness is sworn, I just have a couple of questions. Um, have you reviewed or seen or heard or read any of the trial testimony that's taken place in this case since it started? No, sir, I have not. Okay, thank you for that. I'll just uh, advise you then, please, as you are testifying, make verbal responses to any questions you're answering and try to avoid talking at the same time as any attorney questioning you so we can keep the record clear. With those ground rules in mind, Ms. Rawlings, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please state your name and spell it for the record? Uh, Douglas Halapaska. That's D-O-U-G-L-A-S-H-A-L-E-P-A-S-K-A. -A -A. Thank you. Where are you currently employed? I'm currently employed with the Federal Bureau of Investigation Laboratory Division. I um, work at Quantico, Virginia uh, as a um, forensic examiner in the Farm Central Marks Unit. A forensic examiner in the firearms and tool marks unit. Sure, sure. Um, can you explain what training and ex expertise you have to work as a physical scientist at the firearms and tool marks unit? Okay. Uh, the training is essentially on-the-job training. Uh, for me, that training lasted a little over two and a half years. Uh, when I first arrived in the unit, I received a, a big, lengthy and extensive uh, training syllabus, which outlined a curriculum of study uh, within the discipline of tool mark identification. Um, during that time, I had the opportunity to uh, be under the direct supervision of a senior qualified tool mark examiner. Uh, throughout that training period, uh, I was able to uh, uh, assist this qualified examiner uh, with actual uh, training samples as well as actual uh, evidence samples as well. I was able to tour for several firearms, ammunition, and tool manufacturing facilities, uh, which is critical in the training period because it allows for uh, us to actually firsthand see the examination or the uh, manufacture of the, the tools themselves. Uh, toward the end of the training, I was required to take and pass a series of uh, written competency and uh, oral examinations. And once I passed my final oral examinations, I then actually qualified as a uh, firearms and tool marks examiner within the FBI laboratory. Thank you. FBI laboratory? Is we are getting a little feedback on that microphone, but we're not able to make adjustments, unfortunately, today. We've had a little bit of a technical issue, and it's supposed to be improved, hopefully, over the noon hour, but we're sort of limited on ability to control that, so. Could, could I try to not use the microphone and just project my voice? Would that be? Um, we still need the microphone to pick up the recording for the record, so um, maybe you could just actually push the mic a little away from you, potentially. Okay. <laughs> That was a pretty extensive answer. Do you have any other noteworthy information from your CV? Uh, that I'm a member of the uh, Association of Farms and Tool Mark Examiner. That's a um, uh, organization in which a uh, professional organization I'm a member of. Uh, they provide uh, training. Uh, there's a yearly conference, and there's a, uh, uh, a journal with uh, uh, topics that arrive within the discipline. Uh, so that as well. Thank you. Um, you have been employed at the lab in Quantico for over 13 years now? That is correct. Okay. And how is evidence submitted to the lab at Quantico? Uh, uh, the evidence arrives uh, typically FedEx, but there are some hand-delivered uh, evidence. And once the evidence is received, what happens next? Uh, the evidence arrives in the um, Evidence Management Unit, the acronym is EMU. Um, uh, they just assure that when the evidence arrives, that is, is uh, the packaging it arrived in is intact. Um, they itemize the evidence. Um, they enter the data from the evidence into a software system called Forensic Advantage. <coughs> in it, 
they actually issue a unique identifier for the case, as well as unique identifiers for each piece of evidence. Um, most importantly, uh, they put together an uh, evidence plan. So there's different disciplines within the, uh, the laboratory system. So they basically put together an examination plan. And they also uh, deliver the evidence between the different units. So the different disciplines, uh, once they're completed their examinations, uh, they would just drop off that evidence in a particular uh, evidence storage facility and the uh, evidence management personnel would actually pick it up and deliver it to the next unit. So what process do you follow when evidence arrives at the firearms tool marks unit? Okay, um, that evidence arrives in a uh, drop-off facility, access to pickup facility as well for evidence. Um, once that arrives, uh, either an examiner or a technician will pick up that evidence. Um, once that's done, if active examinations do not start, uh, they will actually just place that evidence into a storage facility within the unit itself. Do you recall what evidence you checked out of the evidence locker in reference to this case? Uh, that would be items 16, 17, and 19. And what agency did these bones come from? Uh, they came from the uh, Ada County Coroner's Office. And do you know if there was an agency reference number associated with those bones? Um, yes, there was. Do you remember what that was? I believe it was 2006-11-61. But if you don't mind, would I check my notes? Uh, Your Honor, may he refresh his recollection to verify that the number is correct? Well, he can be provided his notes, and then we'll see if the defense has any objection to that. I believe he has a closed copy of a folder up there that uh, he can reference, if that's okay. Can I take a look at it? Have you seen it? Yeah. I have not. Okay. Yeah, the defense is entitled to review that first. <clears throat> All right. Mr. Thomas, there's been a request that the witness be allowed to refresh the recollection using the notes. Is there any objection from the defense? No objection. All right. Uh, as you do that, uh, Mr. Halapaska, please indicate if you are referring to your notes and don't just read off them and uh, close the file once you've refreshed your recollection so you're testifying from memory and not from the notes themselves. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm just uh, on the first page of my laboratory report, page one of four. There's Are you a, reading? Is he reading from the note? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. no. I think yeah. we just asked not yeah, to read that. <laughs> Mr. Halapaska, um, I had just asked you what the agency number was, and I think you wanted to just verify that your uh, re recitation was correct. So if you can just look and then... Yes, it was 2006-11-61. Uh, That's correct. Thank you. Uh, now let's talk about how you review the evidence and draft a report. Can you explain what you do first? Okay. There's a couple of uh, terms and definitions I like to define. It may take a little while, but okay. Um, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, is a tool. You know, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask that, that question be asked. It seems like it was a very broad question, and now he's going to go into a narrative, I believe. All right, I'll sustain that objection if you want to ask a new question, Ms. Rawlings. So my question was what you do first. So if you could just give the first part of what you do when you're reviewing evidence and drafting your report, and then we can go okay. forward. Uh, the, the first thing I do is I review the evidence. Uh, so I remove the evidence from the evidence packaging, ensuring that the uh, identifiers on that packaging are consistent with those within the forensic advantage system. Uh, once that occurs, I'm actually going to start reviewing that evidence uh, for any kind of tool marks. Uh, once any kind of tool marks are identified, I'm actually going to document that in my uh, notes. There's some worksheets that I add that information to, either imagery or handwritten. Um, and Mr. Holopaska, I think you mentioned um, you also use some definitions when you're crafting your notes. What are those? Okay, so uh, the first one is a tool. So the basic definition of a tool is to gain mechanical advantage uh, over some object. But when the discipline of tool mark identification, a tool can be thought of is when two objects come into forceful contact with each other and the harder of the two objects is the tool and the softer of the two, two objects, the tool mark. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you do next in drafting your report? Um, 
when I'm drafting my report, I'm actually um, taking the information from my notes. Uh, the notes uh, are used as reference uh, to the report. The reports generate in Forensic Advantage, the software system for the laboratory, and then I generate the report from those uh, from those notes. And what specific items did you look at for your report? Those would be items uh, 16, 17, and 19. Did you use something called casting material? Yes, I did. Can you explain what uh, item that was and what casting material is? Uh, I believe that was item 106. Uh, so anytime material is used uh, from evidence items, it, it becomes secondary evidence. Uh, casting material is uh, basically um, a silicone-based compound. Um, it's administered onto a surface as a thick liquid. Uh, once that substance uh, dries, it dries into a, a rubberized material, and it actually picks up uh, castings of the, uh, the item itself, the tool marks. Thank you. And um, did you explain how you used that material in your analysis, the casting material? Yes, there was a there was a uh, a few items uh, or um, tool marks on the items uh, that I actually took uh, castings of. So there was I actually took five castings uh, from those uh, evidence items, and that's what became uh, item one hundred six which was the secondary evidence. And that is specifically the casting material? That is correct. Okay. Um, does your report go through a review process? Yes, it does. Can you explain how that works? Um, it first goes through a, um, a technical review. That's where another uh, qualified uh, firearms and tool mark examiner reviews both my uh, notes as well as my report uh, for technical accuracy. Uh, once that's completed, it goes through an administrative report or an administrative review. Uh, that's done by a, another individual. doesn't necessarily have to be a qualified uh, tool mark examiner. And they're just checking for um, um, spelling and grammar, accuracy, and stuff like that. And are there any other specific terms that you use when drafting your report that we should know about? Uh, there, there's a, a handful of terms I like to define. Okay. Uh, the first one is, um, so I talked about a tool within the de uh, discipline. So when two objects come into forceful contact with each other, the softer of the two is the tool mark. There's two types of tool marks. There's impressed and strided. An impressed mark occurs uh, when the force onto an object is uh, perpendicular. So the best way to kind of think about that is whenever a you're at the beach, you had a bowling ball, you drop that bowling ball into the sand, you remove that bowling ball, that's your impression. Strata marks occur when uh, both uh, force is applied to an object almost perpendicular to the surface and it generates striations or um, essentially scratch marks. Those are the only type of uh, two types of tool marks that occur. Um, there's two other important terms, class characteristics and individual characteristics. Okay, what are class characteristics? Okay, class characteristics are the general or measurable features of a specimen that would indicate a restricted group source or source population. These are design factors and are determined prior to manufacture. So what I'm talking about is, is tools. Um, the best analogy I can think of right now is if you had a two types of screwdrivers, one being a uh, flathead screwdriver. If you were to use that flathead screwdriver to make an impression, that impression would have uh, basically the general shape of a minus sign in mathematics. Uh, but it would also have other features. Um, there would be measurable features such as the width of that, uh, that tool head as well as the, uh, the length of it. Now when I'm talking about the screwdriver, I'm only concerned with the working surface. So basically that part of the screwdriver that you're using to torque that screw. That's the only part I'm concerned with. That's the part that is manufactured. Other class characteristics are the manufacturing processes that occur on the working surface of that flathead screwdriver. So was that flathead screwdriver made, uh, was it casted, was it milled, uh, was it fractured? 
finishing processes, grinding, bead blasting, coating. Those are class characteristics. The other kind of screwdriver, a Phillips head, and a press mark from a Phillips head will look like a plus sign. So if I had tool marks that had the general impression of minus, and plus, I have two separate source populations. So that is an, an easy way to think of class characteristics. Individual characteristics, they're, they are the rapid and random imperfections that occur to a tool surface. These occur during the manufacturing process, and they're incidental to the manufacturing process. So, the manufacturer does not intend for the working surface of these screwdrivers to have these marks on them. Uh, but these marks are what are used to source identify a tool mark back to a particular tool. And there's a, an examination process I could walk through looking at class characteristics in an individual, or is that? It, what is that process, Mr. Halapaska? Okay, so during the first half, as I told you earlier, I'm focused on documenting uh, those class characteristics into my notes. So what I'm doing is um, I'm documenting those class characteristics into my notes. That's the first half of the examination process. Once that's done, I take all those different source populations of class characteristics and I go to the next level of examination, which is the uh, using the uh, comparison microscope. So essentially, um, it's the microscopic uh, examination of those individual characteristics. The best way to think of a comparison microscope is essentially um, you have two compound microscopes with an optical bridge, which allows me to look at two separate samples under the same viewing field, um, under the same magnification. So at that time, I'm actually looking at patterns of similarity between those two samples. And that's what I use uh, to source identify a tool mark back to a particular tool. Uh, that's, it. that's, in a nutshell, essentially the examination process. Thank you. Turning your attention to uh, the items you examined in your report, the first item that you examined was uh, numbered 16. Do you remember what that was? It was um, a bone. Okay. I'm going to hand you um, what's been marked as States Exhibits 180A through L. And I would note for the record that uh, Defense Counsel and the Court has been provided courtesy copies. All right. And Mr. Halaposka, there is water in the pitcher if you need any water. Thank you. If I could have just a second with counsel. Yes. Mr. Thomas, if you'd like to, why don't you walk oh. over here? We'll turn on the light noise. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't have that available, but still, if you walk over here, it's better than over there. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Halapaska, will you take a minute and look at 
uh, each of those pages, those images. Thank you. Do you recognize those images? Yes, I do. How do you recognize them? Um, I recognize them uh, based on some uh, information that I actually wrote on the bone. Uh, anytime I wrote any kind of um, identifier on the bone, I would uh, write my initials as well as um, digital boxes and lettering that I've added to the, illustri or, uh, to the photographs. Okay. And when were these photos taken approximately? Uh, between the uh, examination period, which I believe was from um, February of 2021 uh, to October of 2021. And you mentioned that some of the photographs have marks on them and some appear to have writing on the bones. Did you place those marks on the photographs and the bones? Yes, I did. Are these images a true and accurate depiction of the bones that you analyzed? They are. And besides the marks that you made on the photographs or the bones, are there any material alterations or deletions to the images? No, there were not. Your Honor, I would move for the admission of State's Exhibits 180A through L. Any objection from the defense? Uh, with, the, uh, with the explanation of, of the photographs where he's written on the actual bones and on the photographs, I have no objection to their admission. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. So exhibits 180A through L are all admitted. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. May I have permission to publish those to the jury? Yes, you may. So, um, Mr. Halaposka, the first, I'm trying, I know I have a softer voice, so um, I'm going to place on the Elmo as 180A. Maybe this will be, no, because we want the scale. How about that? Does that work? That's good. Okay. All right. Um, and what bone is this? I believe that's the hip bone or the pelvic region. Okay. Can you walk us through your analysis of this bone? Um, would it be possible for me to clarify a few uh, uh, terms? I, I'm going to be using repeatedly through all okay. these, these images. All right, what, what terms um, that, that you need to clarify that we haven't gone over? Uh, action type, uh, stabbing action, uh, chopping, and compressive force. Okay, so what's... Uh, compressive force. So I think you said the first one was action type? Yes. Uh, so what is action that? type, uh, for a stabbing action, uh, it could be thought of as essentially... Um, force that's being generated uh, from the tip of a tool um, onto a surface. So that energy will be focused on a single point of that tool. A chopping action um, you could think of as essentially um, when that energy is being delivered from uh, a bladed tool along the long axis of that cutting surface. A compressive force I use uh, uh, in my report, basically just to outline 
any kind of uh, damage to the bone, that I was unable to uh, determine any kind of class characteristics, other than the fact that uh, some force was applied onto it. Okay. And was that all the terms that you needed to clarify? I believe so. Okay. Thank you. I didn't want to miss any. Um, so with regard to Exhibit 180A, I believe there are four um, areas that are kind of outlined on this. Do you have a laser pointer up there with you? Yes, I do. Would you like to use it? I, I would. Okay. Thank you. If you'd please just walk us through those areas. Okay. So um, you can see the bone here. Um, and these are actually the outlines, the digital outline that I drew around the damaged regions. And then I, I lettered each one of them. Uh, so starting with, with A, uh, that I determined was a um, cause from a stabbing type action. Over to B here, which was a chopping type action. And then C and D, chopping type action. Okay. Now, turning your attention to States Exhibit 180B. If, if it's possible, could I just uh, focus on the, the top image? I mean, I, uh, for now. All right, so with regard to um, State's Exhibit 180B, this top image, what does that show? This is a Region A, which I said was caused from a stabbing action. Um, you can see here I've, I've actually written on the bone A, and then next to it is my initials DJH. Uh, the illustrations, I have those there essentially to kind of outline uh, the damage that was occurred uh, to the bone. So this image is a close-up of uh, image, or what was marked as tool mark A in the previous photo, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And uh, the reason I took the close-up image is what I was trying to do is I was trying to document the damage that occurred to the bone. Uh, it's a little difficult to see here, but you could actually see uh, some of the bone here has begun to fracture, and uh, the force of the impact came down at a perpendicular angle. So this fracturing that's occurring here has been driven into the bone. The bone actually has a, um, a hard layer, and there's a hollow layer inside. Uh, so this penetrated that hard layer into the hollow layer, and actually, um, I, I don't capture it here, but there was damage that was occurred onto the other side of the bone that was uh, occurred from here. Uh, what's not captured on the screen is uh, the arrow right here. There's actual radial cracks uh, coming out of uh, the damaged area right here uh, that I was trying to actually uh, document in this photograph. And what other actions did you take in reviewing or analyzing tool mark A on this hip bone? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, first half of my examination is focused on those class characteristics. Uh, the second half, I'm wanting to actually um, identify those uh, individual characteristics. I was examining it looking for those individual characteristics. I was unable to locate any. Uh, so that's when I decided to use the casting material. Again, this that uh, silicone-based compound kind of comes with thick liquid. I applied it into the damaged area, allowed it to harden, removed it. I actually did this t two times, and uh, I was unable to identify uh, any individual characteristics uh, from this, this damaged area. Is there a light on here? 
these black images. Yeah, I'm trying to make it lighter. Oh, thank you. That uh, bottom image is a little dark. Are you able to see that? I can. Okay. And what is uh, that bottom image, if you can describe it for the record? It's, it is the same image as the one uh, that was at the top. However, it, it's just more focused. Or, uh, sorry. The magnification was increased. Uh, it just illustrates uh, the fracturing that occurred and that bone being carried inside the, uh, the damaged area. So essentially just a magnified uh, version of the first photograph that you saw. Thank you. Now, uh, looking at State's Exhibit 180C, the top picture, um, can you describe this for the record? Right. Uh, the damaged area is here. Again, you can see the identifier I gave it, B, my initials, and the arrow is just kind of outlining the, uh, the fractures that occurred. You can see some of the uh, fracturing of the bone that's occurring. It's being driven downward. This again came from a chopping tap action. The energy uh, of that long axis of that blade is being driven down. Uh, this appears to have come from a um, per perpendicular angle. It didn't drive into the, um, all the way through the hard layer of the bone. Uh, but right here you can see basically part of the bone, the harder being driven inside that damaged area. I did take castings uh, from this as well. I took two casts uh, trying to uh, identify individual characteristics. From my examination process, I was unable to identify any individual characteristics from this injury. Uh, did you know anything else is significant with this tool mark identified as B? No. I Okay. Did you take any other actions in reviewing or analyzing it? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. And then with regard to the bottom image on State's Exhibit 180C, can you please explain what we are seeing there? Essentially, it's, it's the same image as the first one, just magnified. So you can actually see the B here. Uh, but what I was wanting to illustrate is you could actually see, uh, again, this injury did not pierce through the hard layer of the bone. So you can actually see at the base of that, that tool mark uh, residual uh, bone fragments that were carried into it. So that was what I was trying to illustrate with that image. All right, now in State's Exhibit 180D, um, there are multiple images on this page. So if we can just start at the top, um, does this contain close-up images of the tool marks you noted as C and D in that very first photograph? They do. All right. And why did you take a closer-up picture of the tool marks you identified as C and D? I was just trying to better capture uh, the the damage to document it in these, uh, these images. All right, what did you know as significant with these tool marks? Okay, looking at the uh, top left image, you can again see how I've labeled them C and D. Again, my initials, DJH. The green arrow, I use it to illustrate that this was a chopping type action, and that the force of this chopping type action, at least in this image, occurred from left to right. Okay. Um, and when you talk about chopping type actions, are you able to identify the type of tools in any of these marks that we've looked at that leave these? Uh, I wasn't able to identify it to a particular tool but there were tool types um, that I was actually able to um, speculate could have caused uh, these marks.
that are essentially uh, chopping tap action are terms I would use was consistent with certain types of tools. And what are those tools? Uh, and this type of chopping tap action, as I have stated in my report, it would be from a, um, a bladed tool uh, such as a uh, cleaver, uh, machete, and I believe a hatchet I used. Thank you. Is there anything else that you need to note on the top two uh, images? Now, there is on the top right. Again, um, uh, you can kind of see my initials right here. So what I did was I just focused inward onto this, um, onto the uh, the damaged area, and you can see this crack occurring right here. Uh, it's it illustrates basically that the force came from this side, and it drove or fractured part of this bone, and it's kind of driving it inside that um, damaged area. Uh, as you may be able to see, uh, this uh, damage cut through the hard layer of the bone and it actually transferred to the other side of the bone as well. Uh, the black arrows here on the right side, they're illustrating basically um, scallop shaped uh, surfaces that were found along the tool mark, uh, which indicate to me that there may have been some type of serrated um, uh, teeth on the, uh, the blade to produce those. Those are actually uh, easier to see if we can. So see right here, this cut or this chopping type action either um, didn't cut through the hard surface of that bone, but it carried a lot of material into it. You see the black arrow actually pointing out these, uh, these teeth structures kind of coming out. Uh, I believe that bladed tool had some type of serrated teeth on it, kind of like saw teeth, like you see on saw. And as it was being delivered through a chopping type action, caused those to flare up. And then you can see the green arrow here, which indicates that the force came from, at least in the image, from left to right. Thank you. Now looking at uh, States Exhibit 180E, the, the top image on that, what does that show? Uh, I'm sorry, could I clarify one more point from the, the last image? Sure, let me grab that one again. The bottom? Do you yeah, want the, the bottom? The only thing I, I, I want to mention is when I was trying, I went in and I was looking for those individual characteristics, I was unable to find them in either C or D. All right, so um, looking at States Exhibit 180E, um, there are two images on this page. The top image, what is that documenting? Uh, this is the same uh, bone, item 16. This is just the back side of the bone. Okay, and why did you take um, a, a picture of the back side of the bone with these uh, marks on it? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the tool marks that I identified on the front side, A and D, I said some of that damage was transferred onto the back side. So region A, as I mentioned earlier, that was from a stabbing type action and that damage transferred through the bone. So that damage actually carried through uh, the hard, two hard layers and didn't necessarily come out of the bone but fractured it so that that tool partially pushed that or ejected that material onto the outside of the bone here. Region D. And Mr. Halaposka, if I can just interrupt, what t are you able to say what type of tool would make that stab <clears throat> mark in identified in mark A? I believe it was some type of a bladed tool, so um, like like a knife. However, I couldn't preclude uh, 
other tools that might have some type of a pointed edge, because you can imagine uh, even a, a, a cleaver, if it's delivered on not the long axis of the blade, but one of the corners may have been able to produce this. But this is consistent uh, with a, um, a bladed tool such as a knife. And what else did you notice significant on this bone? Uh, that D here, that was that chopping type action that I talked about earlier on the front side. I told you some of that damage was transferred onto the back. And you can actually see how it pierced through both uh, the hard layer of the bone on the other side, traveled through that hollow part of the inside, and then partially out on the on the outside. And then uh, E was another tool mark uh, that I identified. Um, it is consistent with a chopping type action, uh, and it did appear to have uh, serrated or was produced from a blade that had serrated tool marks. And the force of the blow, as it illustrated here with the screen arrow, traveled from uh, left to right. All right, and the um, bottom, well, I don't want to change that because the green arrow. Um, the bottom image on State's Exhibit 180E, what is that? What is that of? This is a close-up of E right here. And you can see I actually wrote E in my initials. The green arrow illustrates the direction of the action that occurred. And then right here, the black arrows are just illustrating it. You can see these teeth-like structures that are kind of coming out of the bone. Again, per, most consistently produced with a bladed type of tool that has serrated teeth. Um, did you take any other actions in reviewing the tool marks A, D, or E? Um, yes, I did. I just made observations to identify any individual characteristics if they existed within those tool marks. I was unable to identify any of those uh, individual characteristics. Okay. Looking at State's Exhibit 180F, Um, what portion of the bone does this depict? That is an intact portion of the spine. And why did you take a picture of the mark labeled as, I believe it's labeled as A in Exhibit 180F? Okay, so this is um, item 17. So what I did was I just started over the count. So this is A for item 17. Uh, the mark, the tool mark here, is produced from a chopping type action. As the uh, green arrow indicates, the force of the blow, as far as this illustration is concerned, came from the bottom up. Um, what did you notice significant with this tool mark? Uh, it didn't travel uh, through the hard layer of that bone. Uh, it's difficult to see in the image, uh, but this is not a flat surface. Uh, this portion of the bone right here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's kind of coming out. So this portion here is much higher in elevation uh, than this tool mark. All right, and what other actions did you take in reviewing or analyzing tool mark A on this portion of the spine? Just that I was uh, trying to identify any individual characteristics within that, uh, that tool mark, and I was unable to find any. Okay. And with regard to the bottom image on State's Exhibit 180F, what is that? It, it's just the same image, just magnified. And it just illustrates, uh, are you better see that how the, the tool mark uh, or the tool used uh, didn't pierce that hard layer and that you can actually see um, fractures or pieces of the bone that were actually carried into it.
and States Exhibit 180G. What item was this identified as by your lab? This was uh, labeled as item 19. Okay, and what portion of the bone does this depict? Uh, it is the other half of the hip or pelvic region. So this is a different portion of the hip bone or pelvic region than was identified in item 16, correct? That is correct. And can you walk us through your analysis of this bone with the marked areas? Okay. It, would there be some, if we could actually uh, bring down some of that brightness? Yes, that's, that's perfect. Uh, so I'll start uh, from the left side here. Uh, D is, um, was created from a chopping type action. Um, that damage uh, from the blow actually pierced that hard layer of the bone. Next to it is E, F here, which is kind of difficult to see. You can see it. But what I'm trying to outline here, and you can actually see it, there's a, well, before I go into that, uh, one of the things I wanted to also show you was there was a, what I, I believe were soot marks uh, along here. So part of the bone was uh, damaged, I believe, due to fire. But right here, F, you can kind of see these fracturing kind of coming around here, this little region right there. I was unable to find any tool marks, but it did appear that some type of force was applied to it, which I used as compressive force. Force down on it here, perpendicular, kind of driving this fragment downward, uh, but it was still attached to the bone. Over here on the right, G, you can kind of see this outline here. Uh, I was unable to identify any um, types of class characteristics from it, other than the fact that some type of uh, force was applied onto it, and it just drove in there. And in H, right here, um, it, it, uh, in this, all these G, D, and E, if I didn't mention, were from a, a chopping type action. I'm sorry, G was compressive force, D and E, chopping type action. Uh, H, that was um, from a stabbing type action. You can, it's, it's difficult to see, but you see this little channel here. Uh, it appears that something was um, driven into that and it uh, caused a channel to occur uh, within that hard surface of the bone. And with regard to the compression action, are you able to tell what type of tool was used? No, that was not. And with the uh, other, I think you said, um, chopping type actions, are you able to identify what type of tool was used? Not, not identify, but okay. um, tool marks are consistent with. Would it be possible for me to save that when we do the close-up images? Sure. I think it would be easier to illustrate. Absolutely. <laughs> States Exhibit 180H. There are three um, images on this page. Do you recognize those? Uh, yes, I do. And um, with regard to the top photograph, can you just explain that for the record? Um, you can see the uh, digital box I drew around the tool mark. It kind of looks like a, a tooth mark or kind of like a shark's tooth. Standing up here, the green arrow is based on the top of it. Here's the base. Um, right here, I actually wrote on the bone A in my initials. Uh, what's, what's hard to see in this image is uh, there's, there's more elevation right here. So this occurred from a chopping type action. As the green arrow indicates, it came from the top down. But since this bone was protruding out, had higher elevation, uh, that chopping tap action 
and did not cut into the hard layer of that bone. And uh, also I reviewed it for individual characteristics and, and found none. Uh, I believe uh, tools consistent with potentially making this kind of marks would be from a uh, uh, blade tool such as a cleaver, uh, machete, hatchet, or similar type tools. Did you note anything else that's significant with regard to these tool marks on this top photograph? Uh, for um, B and C, I wasn't able to identify any class characteristics, and I just referred to them as, as fractures. You can see that the bone, some type of force was occurred onto it, and it actually fractured that bone here as well. Uh, It may have occurred from the same impact, uh, but I wasn't able to determine that. And I was uh, unable to determine any kind of tools that would be consistent with making those, that type of damage. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the bottom images, um, what, why did you take a closer up picture of those? Uh, those are just uh, zoomed in images of um, B and C just to better illustrate the, the fracturing that occurred uh, to the bone. So you can actually see how the, uh, the bone is cracking and fracturing, and you got bone that's spurring out uh, from that pelvic bone. What other actions, if any, did you take in reviewing or analyzing these tool marks identified on this bone? Uh, other than just trying to identify any of those individual characteristics, which I was unable to locate any. Okay. And then turning to State's Exhibit I. Um, what does that top photo depict? Okay, so you can see part of my initials here, but just to make sure that they were, I actually wrote on my notes. So that is D, my initials, scribbled and in the date. But what this image illustrates here is, is a close-up of damage to region D. As I indicated earlier, it's from a chopping type action. Uh, the force of the uh, action occurred, at least in the image, from left to right, kind of coming upward. Um, what this illustrates is you can see the fracturing that is occurring from the bone right here, where basically the force of the blow carried over this portion and underneath this side. It cleaved through the hard layer of that bone. All right, did you notice, did you notice anything else of significance or take any other actions in reviewing or analyzing this tool mark noted as D on this portion of the bone? Uh, I also was looking for the individual characteristics, which I was unable to find any. And on the bottom photograph, can you describe that for the record? Okay. So this is a D in its entirety. And next to it is E. Here is F. As you as you recall, that's that's the one I said I couldn't find any class characteristics, though some type of force, compressive force, was administered on it at this point, which kind of caused it to fracture along this area here. But what I want you to focus on is um, E, sorry, E right here. It's the same kind of action coming from left to right, a chopping type action. However, there were uh, what appeared to be uh, uh, teeth-like protrusions coming out of it. Uh, they're consistent with a chopping top action from a tool with uh, serrated teeth. Uh, this one did not pierce through the hard layer of the bone. And did you take any other actions or find anything else of no in an eye analyzing the tool marks identified as D, E, and F in this photograph? Uh, the only other actions I took was just to try to identify individual characteristics. was unable to locate any. 
Thank you. States Exhibit 180J. And can you walk me through the marks that you have on this larger picture first? Yes. So this is a G. You can see right here, uh, I've written on the bone, G, my initials. You could kind of see the outline of uh, the impressed mark. As I mentioned earlier, I was uh, unable to associate any class character characteristics with it other than some type of uh, compressive force was applied to it to cause this, this impression to occur. Up here at the top, H, this came from a stabbing type action. Uh, this was the one from the first illustration I talked about that a little channel had been formed underneath the hard layer of the bone. You could actually see this is the, um, the orifice of it. It is pretty small. Uh, I actually hand wrote on it. It's approximately um, 0 0.058 of an inch in diameter, so pretty small. Um, what else did you find noteworthy regarding the tool marks observed on this portion of the hip bone? Uh, I attempted to take a cast, so this was my final cast of the casting material. I applied it uh, hoping to capture some kind of class, maybe even individual characteristics. I was unable to do that. Uh, can I speak to the other images on the right? Yes, that, that's going to be my next question. Um, with regard to the um, top right photograph, what is this closer image of? So that is just a closer image of H right here. I just kind of <coughs> zoomed into it just so you can kind of see. Here's the orifice. The green arrow indicates the force of the blow occurred here. And you can see behind it some of that channel that occurred from underneath that hard, hard portion of the bone. And again, my initials. Did you take any other actions or find anything else significant with regard to this puncture type mark on the bone? I did not. Okay. Regarding the lower image, uh, why did you take a closer image of the tool mark identified, I think, as G in that portion of the hip bone? Um, I just wanted to illustrate it. It was all the images I took up until that time. You, you, it was very difficult to see it in an image. So all I did here was I was just casting different lights. And so I just kind of cast a shadow. So you're kind of able to better see that outline of that damaged region. So that was my motivation behind actually trying to uh, take that image or taking that image. Thank you. Did you take any other actions or find anything else worth mentioning in analyzing these tool marks? Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> States Exhibit 180K. Um, this appears to be an overview, uh, an overview of all three bones that you analyzed. Is that right? That is correct. And what's significant in this image? Um, this is the only image, or one of two images I have for my notes, that illustrate all the bones in an illustration. So it basically provides you the totality of the uh, tool marks that were imparted onto these, these bones. On the left side, you can see right here I wrote item 19. So this whole bone here is item 19. Item 17 is the portion of the spine. Item 16 is this portion right here. And all I did was I just illustrated in it all the different locations. So to mark A, B, A, and then the course along here. And can you point out any of the images that you were able to identify either class or individual char characteristics for the tool marks? Uh, so for any kind of chopping type action, uh, I didn't identify any tools, but I um, determined tools that are consistent in class characteristics as causing, uh, in this case, a chopping type action. 
Um, that would be A here, chopping type action. A on item 17, chopping action. D and C, chopping type action, as well as B on item 16. Item 16, A would be from a stabbing type action. Okay. And then the last image states exhibit 180L. This is the backside or pos posterior of the bones that were pictured in this last image. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and what did you find noteworthy with regard to the bones in this picture? Again, just trying to illustrate the totality of those uh, tool marks. Uh, this bone here is item 16. Uh, D and A, those are just injuries that are that are transferred from the front side to the back side. So you can actually see that part of the bone was uh, being almost ejected uh, from the back side. Same with D. Recall A here was a stabbing action, D chopping. E here was that chopping top action with a serrated uh, tool mark. And then item 17, you can't see the injury from the back side. Item 19, F. That fractured part, so again, you kind of see the, the outline of the fracture. E and D, it's from a chopping type action. G was as that compressive force, uh, the one where I was unable to identify any kind of class characteristics, the one I just took the cast of. And then B and C were those, those fracture type marks, which again, I wasn't able to associate with any kind of class characteristics. Thank you. Can you summarize your findings or give us um, a nutshell of your findings with regard to the tool mark analysis you performed on these three bones? Okay. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the examination process goes from class characteristics, generating um, different types of uh, source populations for the examination portion, so moving into that identification. I was never actually able to go there in order to, the, to go to that second that microscopic examination um, would require me to have individual characteristics, so I never really got there. So the only thing I was allowed to do or uh, able to do with those class characteristics was basically just outline uh, tools that could have produced those tool marks consistent with. Uh, could we uh, go back to the, uh, the slide prior? So item 16, A, that came from a stabbing type action uh, from a bladed tool such as a knife along the tip. However, I wasn't, be able, I wasn't able to uh, preclude uh, some type of uh, other bladed tool where a portion of um, uh, a corner of that tool, like a cleaver, may have been used. But again, from a stabbing type action, most consistent with a bladed tool with a tip on it. B, D, and C on item 16 uh, came from a chopping type action. Uh, tools consistent with a chopping type action, uh, consistent with these class characteristics, would be um, a cleaver, a machete, or a hatchet. Recall some of them actually had what appeared to be serrated teeth marks or consistent with being created from serrated teeth marks. So some of those uh, chopping type tools uh, may have had uh, serrated type teeth marks on them. A, chopping type action, oh, sorry. A with item 17, the portion of the spine, chopping type action consistent with tools such as a cleaver, uh, machete, 
hatchet. A, on item 19, same type of uh, chopping type tools, cleaver, hatchet, machete. And then uh, B right here, I believe was um, from the fracturing, so no, no determination can be made, no class characteristics were collected from that. And Mr. Halaposka, you were not provided any tools in an effort to match the marks to a specific knife or hatchet or cleaver, is that correct? That's correct. No tools were administered in this case. Only the bones. And could I, uh, uh, sorry, see the other other half and I'll, I'll kind of go through the, yeah. The, the posterior or the backside? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Again. What, what did you note is significant or summarize your findings for us reg with regard to the posterior side, please? Okay. Again, this is just damage. From A, transferred from the stabbing, D, from the chopping. E right here was from a chopping type action, had the serrated teeth marks, again, cleaver, machete, hatchet, or similar type bladed tools. Item 19, I wasn't able to make any determinations for F, G, and then B and C, no class characteristics uh, were able, I was able to obtain from those examinations. E and D, chopping type action uh, consisting with uh, blade tools such as cleaver, machete, hatchet, uh, and I believe one of those had perhaps uh, serrated teeth marks in it as well. All right, Your Honor, may I have just one moment? Yes. <clears throat> I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Rawlings. We will conduct cross that you, Mr. Thomas. I will, Your Honor. <clears throat> Could I have uh, Exhibit 180, the packet? Yes. Good morning, Mr. Hal Pasca. How are you? I'm doing good. Yourself? Good. Uh, you work for the FBI. Are you an FBI agent or an analyst, or what, what do you call yourself? Um, I'm not an agent. I'm a uh, physical scientist, forensic examiner. Okay. And as far as your uh, educational background, are you a doctor, or are you a master's level, or a bachelor's level? I have a uh, bachelor's of science, which I received from Texas A&M University in 2001. I'm currently attending the... Um, National Intelligence University of Bethesda, Maryland, uh, where I'm pursuing a master's degree in uh, science and technology and intelligence. Okay. National Intelligence University? That's correct. Is that a private university or is that run by the FBI or is that... I, I guess I'm just not familiar with it. Can you tell me a little bit about that? It's a, uh, it's a federal level uh, university. Uh, it's... Uh, I believe up until very recently, it was run by the Department of Defense. Okay. And can anybody take classes there, or is it, a, or is it specifically for government agencies? Uh, you have to have a, a top secret clearance. In order to <laughs> okay. There, so. so it's not not for well, everybody. Yes, yeah, mostly just for um, federal employees, but there are there are contractors that work there as well. Okay. All right. Um, and what are you studying at the National Intelligence University? What kind of what kind of things do you study there? Mostly tool marks, or no, no forensics. It's just focused on um, uh, science and technology, basically uh, emerging technologies. Uh, just studying that, just to be aware of any kind of disruptive technologies that may be coming up that the forensic community might have to actually uh, deal with in the not too distant future. So computer type stuff or t uh, digital type stuff rather than than hands on 
bones and whatnot? Uh, nothing uh, concerned with bones. Uh, mostly things like um, additive manufacturing, uh, which is just a different name for 3D printing. Oh, okay. All right. Mr. Thomas, I apologize for the interruption. There's been a request that we take the uh, morning recess at this time. Perfectly We're okay. Started, so sure. why don't we go ahead and do that? We'll be on a recess here for 20 minutes, and then uh, you can continue with your cross. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, we're going back on the record. KCR 22-211624, State versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Mr. Thomas, uh, you can continue with your cross-examination at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, I believe we left off talking about your uh, uh, education and where you're working at the uh, or, or going to a master's program at the National Intelligence University. Um, did you do anything between 2001 and when you started the, when when did you start the National Intelligence University? That would be August of uh, 2022. Okay, so last year. Yes, sir. Any education between 2001 when you graduated from Texas A&M and, and 2022? Other than continuing education uh, with the lab, uh, no, no other uh, formal education. Okay. And when you got out of college in 2001, uh, was the FBI your first job? No, sir. It was not. Okay. What, have you, what, what was your first job out of college? Um, my first job uh, was at the uh, Texas A&M University in the biochemistry uh, physics department. Uh, but unfortunately, a few months after that, uh, I was reactivated into the uh, United States Marine Corps uh, after 9-11. Okay. Wow. Thank you for your service. Um, what did you do? How, how long were you in the Marine Corps? Um, after, little, I guess after, I'm sorry, I don't mean to stop, but after 2001 when you got out, you were reactivated. Let's talk a little bit about the reactivation. How long, how long were you in the Marine Corps? Uh, active service, about one year, and in a reserve, I think, for another, another year. Okay. And so then what did you do after that? Uh, after I completed my service, I went back to uh, Texas A&M, continued working at the university, uh, I believe a year. Uh, then I actually um, got a job working with the um, Drug Enforcement Administration in Miami, Florida as a uh, forensic chemist. Okay. And that was probably in 2004, 2005? I worked there for three years, so I believe yeah, from um, 2004 to 2007. Okay. And then what did you do when you got out of the DEA? Uh, I took a job uh, working for the Army at the uh, testing proving ground in Dugway, um, which is located in Utah. I worked there as a uh, field chemist doing chem warfare uh, chemistry. Okay. And that's in Tooele, Utah? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Uh, and how long were you there? I worked there for a little over two years. Okay. And so that would have been 2009-ish when you left that? Yes, sir. And then where'd you go? Uh, that's when I uh, was uh, offered an opportunity to uh, uh, join the uh, FBI. Okay. And you've been at the FBI ever since? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and so you indicated on direct exam that you did training for about two and a half years. Is that right? That is correct. And was that training specifically on the tool mark uh, uh, portion of, of, of your FBI work? Uh, Yes, um, it, it was. Um, part of it is with the firearms aspect, but you can think of an, a firearm as really nothing more than a, um, a collection of tools in order for it to operate. So, yes, the entire time I was I was working on um, tool marks. Okay. And you said you were directly supervised by a tool mark examiner. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. They're... Um, I guess to expand on that, there was actually a, 
a training coordinator who's responsible for the entire program, but you're actually a, every trainee uh, has a, a, a mentor, uh, and they just kind of guide you through the process. Okay. Uh, and your mentor was with you the whole two and a half years? He was, um, during the entire two and a half years, yes, he was training me. Okay. Um, and so uh, how many other times have you worked uh, since 2009, 2010 area, the last probably 14, 15 years, um, on bones with um, knives or machetes or those, the types of implements that were used in this particular case? Uh, those are infrequent examinations. They don't occur that often. Okay. And over the course of your career with the FBI, how many times do you think? Less than 10? I would say maybe about five or six times. Five or six okay. times, okay. And does the FBI have a, I don't know, I guess, I guess what I'm thinking is that when somebody brings something in, you have a vast array of tools you can choose from to try to match up what, what, that, what, what caused an injury. Is that correct, or am I kind of thinking in fantasy land? No, you're, you're correct. There, um, there are different uh, reference collections. So if this um, case involved firearms, there's a large reference collection that I could use as tools. Um, we have a large tool room that has um, different uh, reference tools that, that are available to us. You are correct. Okay. And so in this particular case, when the bones came in and you were given the task of identifying the tool marks, did you go into that? A vast collection of or different collections of, of tools to see what may have caused these particular uh, traumas or injuries or marks? That That is correct. I did. Um, uh, the thing about doing the tool marks, it's not just uh, the tools that you're using, but the, uh, the, the surface or media you're testing on. So mm -hmm. that is correct. Okay. And so when you're testing on this type of media, <clears throat> you have to know uh, some background like how many foot-pounds of, of pressure it would take to cause this particular injury, right? No, you don't have to actually uh, go that, that far. Um, the efforts are using the, uh, the tools available, the reference tools, and uh, different media sources to try to replicate those marks. So... Uh, uh, in situations like that, I'm just taking a tool and I'm trying to replicate uh, whatever type of uh, tool mark that was created using those reference tools as well as the uh, the media which I'm testing it on. And so what type of reference tools did you use on this particular case? I used a um, collection of uh, different types of uh, bladed knives, uh, hatchets, a couple of uh, machetes, um, it was just a, a lot of different tools uh, that I used. And so that's where you came to the conclusion that this was either made by a machete, a hatchet, or a knife. I didn't. In the report, I specified they were consistent uh, with. So um, the injuries, or the, sorry, the tool marks that I saw, the types of tool marks uh, were consistent with those types of tools. Uh, I do. I do want to specify too that um, aside from generating a report and testifying the report, it's also used as a um, as a uh, uh, a lead source for mm -hmm. law enforcement. So um, it allows them to actually kind of read over those tools and then in their investigation uh, try to locate any tools that are, are similar to those, which could be submitted or resubmitted to the laboratory uh, for testing. And so in this particular case, there was testimony that some tools were seized uh, by the FBI, by your agency, and then um, you, you indicated on direct examination that none of those tools were actually used in, in trying to figure out what caused these particular injuries. Is that correct? Your Honor, I'm going to object. Counsel is um, testifying to facts not in evidence and um, asking for information that... Uh, I think there's not an adequate foundation for for this witness to answer. I'll overrule that objection at this time. So, so there were tools that were seized. If I could just repeat the question, is that okay? Yes. So there were tools that were seized by the FBI, 
and your agency, and you testified that no tools came to you from any other agency or your own agency to test with this particular, these particular bones. Is that right? There were no tools submitted. So the only evidence that was submitted to me were the bones. No tools were actually submitted to the laboratory. Okay. I wasn't aware of any tools. Okay. And did you ask anybody if there were any tools that were seized? No, I did not. Okay. Is there any reason why you didn't do that? No. Once the report is issued, essentially that case is kind of closed out. And for the laboratory, at least for my unit, you're just moving on to the next examinations and generating those reports as well. So I did not follow up on this case other than the fact that once that report was issued to the field. Who issued the report? Oh, I issued the report. Okay. But before you issued the report, you didn't go back and say, hey, in order for me to complete my report, I would like to see some sort of, did you gather anything? You didn't ask any of those questions. No, I did not. Okay. And you said there's no particular reason why you didn't. I wasn't aware that there was any tools in the case. I assumed if there were tools in the case, they would have been submitted to the laboratory. Okay. So it was somewhere down the chain that may have screwed up and not submitting them to you. Yeah, there were no tools submitted to me. I don't know how that process works. Okay. And do you think that would have been more helpful to find out maybe if these tools were the ones that made these marks? It would have been helpful to have tools to analyze in the case. That is correct. Okay. When these specific specimens came in, and I call them specimens because my question is, was there any flesh before you got the bones on these specimens? There were not. It was pretty much just the bone material. There was some dry tissue, but not much. Okay. So did you, in your analysis, did you assume that whatever cut through to the bone would have gone through skin, tissue, muscle, those kinds of things prior to hitting the bone? I was aware of that fact. And is that the assumption you made in making your report? No. My analyst was just focused on those tool marks on the bone. Essentially, all I'm doing is looking at those tool marks and trying to determine those class characteristics. Okay. As far as the class characteristics, you're basically saying what type of implement was used to make these particular marks? Yes, that's correct. The tool marks that were made or the tool marks that were imparted onto the bones, through my training experience, I was trying to generate those class characteristics and then go through the examination process. But I was not able to make any direct determination other than just tools that are consistent with producing those types of marks. You indicated that there was possibly some serrated type of a tool, right? That is correct. Did you come to a conclusion that it was a serrated tool or just that it was consistent with a serrated tool? That the tool marks had consistent marks, or sorry, that the tool marks had marks that were consistent with being produced from a serrated tool. Okay. And with that particular injury with the serrated tool, how far apart were these serrated tool marks? I did not measure those. Okay. Essentially, when they were produced, they were adjacent to each other. Okay. Is there any reason why you didn't measure the width of the teeth on that serrated? During the analysis, it wasn't essential. Had there been a tool that came with a case or was submitted with the bones, then yes, those measurements would have been appropriate. Okay. 
one of the things that you indicated in, in defining the class characteristics, uh, you kind of went through uh, the different things, and then you said something about microscopic characteristics. You recall that? Yes, the okay. types of uh, tools, yes. Okay, and so did you uh, put these bones under the microscope and look at the, at the tool marks under the microscope? I was unable to locate any of those uh, individual characteristics, so I was never actually able to move on to the uh, uh, microscopy part of the examination. Okay. So is it is it true that you don't know what caused these marks? You just know that it was something. Uh, that's correct. Uh, all I know is the marks are generated by some tool uh, that's consistent in making those marks. But no, I don't know exactly what tool was used. Okay, and you weren't able to differentiate whether it was a man or a woman who may have done this. Oh no, I would. That's not something I could determine from examining the tool marks. Okay. In examining the tool marks, were you able to identify how much force would have had to have been applied? No, I did not. That's not something that could be determined from the, uh, the tool marks. Okay. Is there someone in your department that you know of at the FBI who could determine how much force would have been applied and that may have been something to, to pass this particular piece of evidence on to? That's not an examination uh, that the laboratory conducts, at least not in the uh, Farms and Tool Marks Unit. Okay. Are you part of the, uh, I, let me just, let me put it this way. Uh, is there any interdepartmental discussions as to um, where to go from when you're done with yours uh, to to what we should do next type thing. Uh, that's left essentially up to the case agent. So the case agent uh, for the case, uh, essentially the laboratory, the forensic uh, examinations. That's just kind of one part of the uh, uh, the investigative package. Okay. So, and, and I don't mean to overgeneralize the FBI or or your particular lab, but I, I'm. And tell me if this analogy works for you. I'm kind of uh, uh, m making the comparison of me walking into the Home Depot and saying, hey, I need a nut that is, um, you know, uh, three-quarters of an inch in diameter, and I go ask the guy, and he, he gives me that. And your lab is that specialized where you are basically, you ask me to do something, and I do it, and I don't give you any other uh, further information is that is that where we're at? The laboratory is is fortunate that there are a lot of uh, disciplines that exist within within the laboratory that are um, that are, are rare rare in state and local laboratories. Um, I believe the laboratory, the FBI laboratory, uh, makes a lot of effort to try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, but you are limited to uh, the evidence itself. Essentially, for for myself and the examination of those tool marks, uh, the examination cannot really uh, go much beyond the tool marks themselves. So I'm not thinking about or analyzing the amount of tissue uh, between the uh, uh, tool and the surface of the bone. I'm just focused on the tool marks on the bone.
the difference between the stabbing uh, tool marks and the chopping tool marks. Um, can you, because that's basically what we have here. We don't have anything else other than stabbing and chopping, correct? That is correct. All right. And it looks like you identified one stabbing tool mark and the rest were chopping type tool marks, right? I was able to determine that those um, tool marks were consistent with, because um, uh, identification is a, a whole different, um, a source identification basically is when uh, I'm identifying a tool back to a tool mark. Uh, no identifications were made in this case. Uh, so yes, from the examinations, uh, two which occurred from a stabbing and the majority of the rest occurred from a chopping action. Okay. So the chopping and the stabbing, I'm, I'm a little confused with what's, which is which. So the stabbing would be something with a finite uh, width and length, or, or at least width. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the energy that's being uh, transferred from the tool to the uh, surface is a... Uh, is focused on a, a, a very narrow area where a chopping type action uh, still force is being applied, but that force is being um, focused over a, uh, I think I used the term, a long axis of the cutting blade. Is that, um, does that answer your question, sir? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, and so would these injuries be consistent with um, Someone who was sophisticated or unsophisticated, do you know? Oh, I, I couldn't answer that question. Okay. I don't have any further questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Redirect, Ms. Rawlings. Mr. Halaposka, um, two things. I think you were asked um, whether, I think if the phrase was something caused these marks, but you've identified certain class characteristics. Is that right? Yes, I made determinations on the, the type of class characteristics that could cause uh, those, uh, those tool marks, those injuries. And what were those again? Um, you're talking about the, the tools or the, the, the types tools. of? The uh, tools. So for the stabbing type action would be a, a bladed tool like a knife. Uh, the chopping type actions, and these are again consistent with um, a bladed type uh, tool such as a cleaver, a machete, and a hatchet. Okay. And then some of those class characteristics did have serrated or appeared to uh, have serrated uh, teeth on them. All right, and we talked about stabbing, chopping, and I think previously you talked about compression actions. Are those also, are those related to uh, chopping actions? Um, they could be. It's just that um, I wasn't able to uh, garner any class characteristics. So in the situations when I used the term compressive force, uh, I knew that some kind of force was applied to those bones, but there were no class characteristics for me to kind of uh, source populate it, uh, like when I talked about the... Uh, the uh, screwdrivers, the the flat head, and the and the Phillips. I wasn't able to differentiate uh, with those two um, uh, tool marks or injured areas that had those um, compressive forces applied to them. And based on the tool marks in this case um, on the bones, if you had been provided specific tools, would you have been able to utilize them in identifying the marks? I would have been able to make uh, test marks with them. But as you recall, throughout the examination process, I wasn't um, able to locate any individual characteristics. Uh, so I would have been able just to make the same um, general um, uh, characteristics. Term, basically, just I wouldn't be able to I, source identify the tools back to the bones because the bones didn't have those individual characteristics that would have allowed me to. Uh, in order to make those source determinations. I don't have anything further, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rawlings. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Thank you for 
Your appearance is the witness excused or released from any subpoena? Yes, he is, Your Honor. Any objection? To no objection. Defense? Thank you, Sorry. Mr. Thomas. So, uh, Mr. Halapaska, you may be excused and the bailiff will assist you out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the state can call its next witness. Your Honor, the state will be calling Mr. Sincerbo. Before we begin with examination, then I'll just briefly ask the witness who's now under oath, Mr. Sincerbo, have you in any way reviewed any of this trial testimony, either by reading it, listening to it online, or uh, in any of the locations where this trial's been broadcast since it started? No, I have not. Okay, thank you for your response to that. Um, in your questioning, please make verbal responses to any question asked to you so we can keep a clear record and try to avoid speaking at the same time as any attorney that is questioning you and uh, just speak directly into that microphone as well. And with that in mind, Ms. Smith, you can commence with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good morning. Good morning. Can you introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the, uh, the jury and spell your last name? My name is David Sincerbo, and my last name is spelled S-I-N-C-E-R-B-E-A-U-X. Okay. Sir, how are you employed? Um, currently, I'm retired from the Idaho State Police. I actually am umpiring softball for um, Northern Idaho. Okay. Um, so before you retired, and um, did you and you worked at the lab? What did you do at the Idaho State Lab? Um, my primary job was to analyze controlled substances, but I also did fire debris analysis, um, and I've been doing that for 26 years. What was your educational background um, before starting at the lab? I have a bachelor's of science degree in chemistry from Cal State Northridge, and I was an analytical chemist since 1985. Okay. Uh, so what is an analytical chemist? Um, basically, I test either evidence or other substances for particular chemical substances. So in your background as an analytical chemist, were you always at the Idaho State Lab? No, I was not. Where were you before that? Um, I worked in Southern California as an environmental chemist for two different um, corporations. Okay. And um, in that capacity, what did you do? Um, primarily for that is I was, um, since it was environmental, I did anything from pesticides, but our main focus was underground storage tanks, so I did a lot of gasoline and diesel, basically stuff from gas stations. Okay. Um, and in your capacity in, as an analytical chemist throughout your career, have you ever had a chance um, in your experience to examine fire debris? Yes. Um, what have you done with that? Um, for the last 10 years or so um, at um, Idaho State Police, we tested things for suspected arson cases. Okay. And... Um, you also talked about doing a chemical analysis. Um, what do you mean by chemical analysis? Um, we use a variety of instruments and or um, wet chemistry techniques to analyze um, evidence for the presence of ignitable liquids. Okay. Um, throughout the years, do you have any idea of how many items um, or pieces of evidence that you have examined for the presence of chemicals? For for both fire debris and yes, um, tens of thousands. Okay. Um, of that group, have you ever had a chance to look for the presence of gasoline? Yes. Okay. Um, what process do you use to look for gasoline in items? 
Um, what we do is um, once the evidence gets into our possession, um, I'll walk you through the whole thing. The first thing we do is we check to make sure, or when I receive it, I check to make sure that it's in a sealed condition. If for some reason it is not, we have the option of either returning it to the agency or if it's a minor thing such as, you know, let's say if there was a piss, uh, missing piece of evidence tape or something like that, we can put that on and we'll just note that in our notes. Once we do that, we bring it back to our um, lab bench area. Um, if it's a, typically it's going to come in a friction lid can, which is basically a paint can. Um, we will um, open that up, make a quick observation of what it looks like, what's on the inside. From there, we'll put in a um, small strip of um, activated charcoal. Um, we basically suspend that in the can. Put that once if we reseal it, we put it back in an oven. We cook it for about four hours at 70 degrees centigrade, which is about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Once it's done baking, we basically take it out, let it cool to room temperature. We will then extract the um, carbon strip that is in there. We put that carbon strip in a um, little glass vial, has add some solvent to it. That solvent we then inject onto an instrument called a GCMS, and that will tell us what compounds may or may not be present. Okay. So um, in uh, Idaho State Lab, um, lab number 2020-2233, um, did you examine item 17 submitted by the Rexburg Police Department um, as, a part, as part of your duties at the Idaho State Lab? Yes, I did. And do you recall what item 17 was? Um, it was a pint-sized um, can that contained some um, decomposing flesh and other debris. Okay. Um, what analysis did you um, do of item 17 from the Rexburg Police Department of the decomposing flesh and debris? Um, like I just um, previously stated, I put in a cart, uh, charcoal strip sealed up the can, baked it, and then extracted the strip, and then ran it on a GCMS. Okay. And um, that item 17 was from the Rexburg Police Department with the names associated of Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow, and J.J. Vallow, amongst others? That is correct. Okay. And so when you examined item 17 and you did your chemical analysis, what results, if any, did you get of that decomposing flesh? Um, in that can, that can contain gasoline. Okay. Um, and the item, when you say in that can, was that the, the flesh in the can? It, it since um, the gasoline that we actually analyze, um, when we heat it up, it basically, um, if there's any volatile liquids, they will become a vapor. They will then attach to it. Um, so it, whether it was in the in or on the flesh or in the other debris that was in that can, I have no idea from whence the source was. It's just in that can contained gasoline. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Thomas, cross-examination. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Sensorbaugh. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> you indicate that you are an analytical chemist. That is correct. And you used to work for the ISP, and now you're an empire? Yes. <clears throat> um, so your specific task was, was to see if there was gasoline present in uh, the debris that was sent to you? The Basically for any um, ignitable liquids, gasoline or other. Okay. And other being something like propane or ca kerosene or something like that? Um, not so much propane. <laughs> propane since that'd be a gas, but yeah, it's going to be know. you know paint thinners or uh, basically up to diesel. Okay. Um, and you said you put this into, uh, it came in a paint can. Was it a, was it a, a one-gallon paint can, or do you recall? I, I guess I should ask, it, do you recall? It was a pint. One pint. Yes. Um, and there are four pints in a gallon, is that right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Actually, no, there's four quarts in a gallon. Okay. And I think there's two pints per a quart. So it's a very small 
can. Yeah, about that big round. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, not very big. So, okay. So I'm thinking about when I go to the store to buy paint. I know the gallon size, what it, what it looks like, and then the next size down is either the pint or the quart. That would be the quart, and then there's the smaller one, which is kind of like I a test. The, yeah, for the, for the layman, if you okay. were having a small one that you wanted to see if the paint was going to look good on your wall, you'd buy okay. that one and gotcha. see if it looked right. And that's the one that came to you. That's the size that came to you. Correct. Great. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then you you. Popped it off, popped off the top of it, um, and how, how full of that particular can was this substance in there? I don't recall exactly. When we um, give advice to the people who are actually taking the samples for it, we we want at least um, you know as much as kind of we can get, but it, we want to have some head space, so we want it about three quarters full. And if I vaguely remember, it's probably about half to three quarters full. Okay. And uh, the, the, the prosecutor, Ms. Smith, indicated that it was um, flesh. Uh, I believe she said flesh. Did, did she say flesh that was in there? I believe, Do you recall? I believe so. I, mean, All right. I, I think that's what I put down in my notes was that and other debris. Okay. And I guess the other debris is what I'm looking for. What, what, how much of the other debris was it as opposed to the flesh type thing? I, I don't recall exactly. Okay. Um, probably 50-50. Okay. Be a, I guess. So 50% dirt and other stuff, and then 50% of the flesh. Correct. All right. And then you put an activated charcoal strip? Correct. Um, and is that, <clears throat> I guess I, kn I know what activated charcoal is. It's just a, a like, like charcoal, right? But what does the strip look like? What, what, what are we looking at? Um. To be exact, it's 100 square millimeters. Um, it's basically a small little strip. It's about a half, half inch, three quarter inch long and about a quarter inch wide. Okay. And it's basically, it's a polymer that has the activated charcoal embedded in it. Okay. And is it kind of flexible like a piece of paper or is it more hard like a piece of wood? Um, more flexible. More flexible, okay. Um, sort of like construction paper. And do you, uh, do you like suspend it somehow with a piece of string or something? I don't know how you do that. How um, do you do that? What we actually use is, um, Christmas tree ornaments, um, hangers. And we oh, basically okay. just stick it through and then bend it and put it in through the lip of the, um, can and then put the lid on and it basically suspends on one end of the hanger. Okay. But you don't want it to touch the actual substance that's in there, right? You, tr you try not to. Try not to touch it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then you said you put it in a GCMS. Uh, for the layperson, that is a gas uh, chromatograph mass spectrometer. Is that right? That is correct. All right, um, and that uh, and that you just you just put a little charcoal strip in there, right? We actually put the solvent. We take the charcoal strip, put that in a glass vial, add some solvent, um, which it happens to be solvent called carbon disulfide. We will put that. Okay. <laughs> And then we um, put the charcoal strip in there, and then we add a solvent, which is carbon disulfide. All right. And so, um, and that solvent is how, how much? Uh, how much of that solvent goes into the GCMS? Um, in the actual GCMS, we inject inject one microliter. Okay. And so, if that were in a syringe. How much of a uh, 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 how much what would it look like to a layperson like like somebody on the jury? What would that look like? It's not a lot. Um, it's if you had a drop of water, it's about probably about a tenth of a drop of water. Okay. And so, uh, does that go on a slide like a glass slide? No. Um, I'll explain really briefly what a GCMS and how it works. Sure. The GCMS, the gas chromatograph, is a fancy temperature-controlled oven that has a column that's on the inside. What happens is, is when we inject that small amount of liquid, it hits an injection port that is at about 280 degrees centigrade, um, which basically flashes it and makes it a vapor. That vapor is then swept along through that column, and then it will separate out organic molecules primarily by molecular weight meaning small, lightweight ones come through faster, heavier ones take more time. 
Once it has done that separation, it then goes into the mass spectrometer, which is a detector, which takes that organic molecule, hits it with a bunch of electrons, it basically fragments it, and we collect the fragment, um, fragmentation, we get a pattern. We compare that pattern to known standards, and that's how we make our identification. In the case of gasoline, we are looking for a, a wide variety of compounds that are indicative of gasoline, and if they're present, we compare that to a known, our known set of standards, and that's how we make our identification. Okay. And isn't it true uh, that you can actually tell which particular companies are producing this particular type of gas? No. You um, can't. Some, some people in our field will claim they can do that. Um, I do not believe that ISP or realistically anyone else has that okay. ability. Um, we don't perform that at, at ISP. Just to me, I think it's unreliable. Okay. So you weren't able to identify any specific detergents that might be associated with Chevron or any type of uh, uh, compounds that Shell says that we we have this particular uh, uh, compound in our in our gasoline. And for ISP, no, we do not. Okay. Um, and so the bottom line is, you found gasoline. Uh, in that debris and or flesh, right? That is correct. Okay. You, did, you weren't able to uh, quantify how much gasoline based on uh, an extrapolation formula or something like that? No, it, it's just it had all of the components of gasoline. Okay. So it could have been uh, anywhere between um, just a little bit to a whole bunch. Correct. I mean, okay. it's basically enough for me to detect that there was gasoline present. All right. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. And there's no redirect, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? Any objection to excusing the witness? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you for your appearance. Uh, Mr. Sinserbo, you can be excused. And thank you for your testimony. The bailiff will assist you out of the courtroom. All right, the state can call its next witness. Judge, at this time, the state will call Rylene Nolan. All right, now that the witness is sworn, let me just inquire before we start with examination. Um, have you previously viewed any of the trial testimony in this case, listened to it, or read about it? I have not. Okay. Thank you for that. Please uh, respond to any questions verbally so we can keep a clear record. Please try to avoid speaking at the same time as anyone that's questioning you and talk directly into that microphone so we get a good record. And with that in mind, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you may. Thank you. Can you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Rylene, R-Y-L-E-N-E, R -Y -L -E -N -E, Nowlin, N-O-W-L-I-N. Thank you. Where are you employed? I am employed by the Idaho State Police Forensic Services Laboratory in Meridian, Idaho. Uh, in what capacity are you employed? I am the Forensic Laboratory Manager. Could you please tell the jury your educational background um, and related work experience that brought you to the position you have now? I have a Bachelor of Science from the College of Idaho. I've completed hundreds of hours of training in biology screening as well as DNA analysis. I began my career in forensics with the Idaho State Police Forensic Services Laboratory in 2002. I was a bench analyst or an everyday scientist in the biology DNA unit uh, until my promotion to laboratory manager in 2014. Uh, my duties included analyzing items of evidence for the presence of body fluids, as well as processing items of evidence uh, for a DNA profile. I was also qualified in the DNA database unit, which is analyzing samples from convicted offenders for upload to the uh, national DNA database. 
since promoting to lab manager, I have retained my qualifications in the DNA unit. Uh, my duties as lab manager include overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the laboratory. I supervise the heads of each department in the laboratory, and I oversee our evidence unit. Thank you. Do you belong to any professional organizations? Yes. Uh, which ones? I am a member of the Northwest Association of uh, Forensic Scientists, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, the uh, Association of uh, Crime Laboratory Directors, the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors. Uh, I'm also a uh, molecular biology fellow with the American Board of Criminalistics. And have you testified as an expert regarding D DNA analysis previously? Yes. Approximately how many times? Uh, approximately 85 times prior to today. Okay. And have you done, uh, how many times have you tested DNA? I, I would say over the course of 20 years, I've tested thousands of samples. Okay. Uh, let's talk about DNA for a minute. Um, at a 101 level, what is DNA? Uh, DNA is a substance that's found in the cells of our body, and it acts as a blueprint. It tells our bodies not only what form to take, but how to function. Okay, and so do we all have different DNA? Uh, between individuals, with the exception of identical twins, uh, our DNA is over 99% the same. Uh, and in forensics, uh, we're targeting that less than 1% that's unique to an individual, again, with the exception of identical twins. Okay, so, so for any two people in this room, their DNA is about 99% the same. That's correct. That's why we all have the same basic form and our bodies function in the same way. Okay. Uh, which body fluids contain DNA? Um, DNA is found in the cells in our body. So, for instance, in our saliva, it's our cheek cells that are sloughed off into that saliva. Uh, in our sweat, it's our skin cells that are sloughed off into that. Uh, DNA is also found in our bones and teeth as well. Okay. And how can DNA testing be used in forensics? Uh, in forensics, Again, we're looking at those portions of DNA that are unique to an individual. They don't tell me anything about an individual. I can't tell you what color eyes they have, what color hair, how tall they are. Uh, but I can use that profile that's generated from an item of evidence and compare it to known individuals in a case to determine the source. Okay. And, and what do you mean by profile? Um, a DNA profile is developed in, in uh, our laboratory we look at multiple different locations on the DNA. And half of our DNA comes from our mom and half from our father. And in looking at those, you receive one variable from each parent. So if I can compare it to blood typing, um, blood typing, it's a letter. So we're looking at um, is it, did you receive an A from one parent and a B from another parent, so you're an AB? This is the same, except we're looking at many more locations, and instead of a letter, it's a number. Okay. And what is the process to determine uh, who a forensic sample originated from? It's a multi-step process. Um, the first step, as I mentioned, DNA is found in our cells. So the first step is to break open those cells and pull the DNA out, uh, and then remove all of the other cellular components from that sample. The next step is a process for determining how much DNA is present in that sample. Um, once that's determined, because in forensics we are typically looking at very low amounts of DNA, uh, the next step is called molecular Xeroxing, and it's similar to uh, you have a whole dictionary, but you only want to look at 24 pages in that dictionary. So you're just going to copy those particular pages. Those are those specific locations on the DNA of interest in forensics. Uh, and it copies them a million fold so that there is enough present to visualize. Uh, it's then put on an instrument called a genetic analyzer, and that is what interprets uh, the DNA and gives those number assignments at each of the locations. And those number assignments at each of those locations, is that called a DNA profile? Uh, we refer to that as a DNA profile, yes. Okay. Um, 
So once you generate a DNA profile, uh, what can you do with that? Uh, can you compare it to other DNA profiles? Yes, it can be compared to other profiles if there was DNA on multiple items of evidence in a case. Uh, and it can also be compared to known samples from individuals involved in a case. Okay. Is this method widely accepted by the scientific community? Yes, it is. And what steps do you take to ensure the process works correctly? Uh, there are multiple steps that are taken uh, to ensure the process works correctly. There are controls built into the system. So there are uh, samples known as negative controls. Essentially, they go through the same process as all of the other samples, but no DNA is added to those. Um, so at the end, they should be free from DNA. If there's any DNA present in those, then we have to go back and look to see if something happened. Uh, there also is a sample of a known DNA profile. So at the end, I can look at that and make sure the correct profile was obtained so that I know the process worked correctly. Uh, in addition, we have multiple safeguards built in. So when I go into the laboratory, um, everything is bleached down, clean paper is put down. I prepare myself by wearing a lab coat, a mask, gloves, my hair is pulled back. Um, only one item of evidence is ever open at a time, uh, and evidence samples are processed uh, separately in time and space from samples from known individuals. Okay. Is the Idaho State Police Lab an accredited DNA forensics lab? Yes, we are. Uh, what accreditation standards do you meet? We are accredited through the American Association for Laboratory Accreditation, commonly known as A2LA. Uh, we are accredited uh, under the ISO 17025, and that's the International Organization for Standards. Uh, 17025 are standards specific to laboratories, just in general laboratories. They have a separate set of standards known as R221, and those are the standards specific to forensic laboratories, so we have to be accredited to all of those standards. In addition, because Idaho State Police Forensic Services um, uploads samples to the National DNA Database, the FBI has established a separate set of standards known as the quality assurance standards for forensic casework laboratories that we also uh, must adhere to and be um, audited under. And just, I should have asked you this earlier. Oh, no, I did ask you that earlier. Never mind. Were you assigned to work at case M2020-2233? Yes, I was assigned to work uh, some items of evidence in that case. Does this case correspond to the state of Idaho versus Lori Daybell or Lori Vallow? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, for your involvement, what items were sent forward for DNA testing in this case? Uh, the items that I was specifically um, asked to examine um, were, do you want the laboratory case item number or just a description? Uh, just a description at this time. Um, so the first item were biological samples said to be uh, collected from Tylee Ryan, um, and that consisted of uh, molars and a section of rib. Uh, I was also given uh, biological samples said to have been collected from a Joshua J. Vallow, <laughs> also consisted of molars and a section of rib. I was also given known samples um, from individuals in the case, specifically uh, Mr. Dennis Trahan, T-R-A-H-A-N, uh, as well as uh, Ms. Vallow. Okay. Uh, let's talk about uh, Tylee Ryan. Uh, did you do any DNA testing regarding Tylee Ryan? Yes, I did. Uh, what did you do? Uh, I performed DNA analysis of one of the molars that was submitted, um, and that process involves thoroughly cleaning the exterior of the tooth to remove any surface contaminants or bacteria that could be present, um, and then taking that tooth and creating it a pulverized powder, and then that powder is what went forward through that multi-step DNA process that I explained earlier um, to generate a DNA profile from that item. Okay. And were you able to generate a profile from that item? Yes, I was. Uh, 
And did you do any comparisons between that DNA profile and any other known DNA profiles? I did. Who did you compare it against? Uh, I compared it to a DNA profile generated from uh, the sample from Lori Vallow. Did you write a report detailing the results uh, of that uh, of that testing? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, what were those results? Um, the comparison I performed was, sorry, that's echoing a little bit, um, was to determine if um, Lori Vallow could be the, a possible parent to the deceased individual said to be Tylee Ryan. Uh, so I calculated a statistic. Um, it's known as the single parentage index. Um, and what I determined was that Lori Vallow could not be excluded from being uh, the biological mother of the deceased individual said to be Tylee Ryan. Um, the single parentage index, which is a statistical calculation um, for the locations of DNA that I examined, um, was 2,528,000,000, um, and that 99.9999 percent of the female population would be expected to be excluded from being a biological mother of the deceased individual said to be Tylee Ryan. Okay. Um, is there a way to get to a hundred percent of excluding every other woman as being the mother of Tylee Ryan? Um, in paternity statistics and paternity calculations, uh, I'm basing it on a population database. Um, and that, that number I gave, that, that five or two billion number, uh, that's a likelihood ratio. So it's comparing um, the two hypotheses. So the first hypothesis is uh, Lori Vallow is the biological mother of the deceased individual. And the second hypothesis is she's not. So that's calculating how likely are those two hypotheses. Um, and the only way to get to 100% because you're only looking at one half of an individual's DNA uh, would be to test every woman in the world and compare to that sample. Okay. Uh, but can you just state again for the record what number of women, the percentage, are excluded from being the mother of Tylee Ryan? Uh, based on the um, locations of DNA that were analyzed, it's expected that 99.9999% of women would be excluded from being the biological mother of the deceased individual said to be Tylee Ryan. And what was the statistical likelihood that Lori Vallow is the mother of Tylee of in this DNA testing of Tylee Ryan? So to state that differently, um, it is... 2,528,000,000 times more likely that Lori Vallow is the mother of the deceased individual as opposed to another randomly selected woman from the population being the mother. Okay. And I, I realized the way I was asking that question is probably not totally appropriate because we're talking about samples, correct? And so uh, the uh, that was based on the known sample of Lori Vallow and then the uh, the sample from the molar of what was assumed to be Tyler Ryan, correct? Correct. I did a comparison of those two Thank items. You. Did you do any DNA testing related to J.J. Vallow? I did. I had the uh, tooth sample said to be from Joshua J. Vallow. Was there anything remarkable about that tooth sample? Uh, the tooth sample was different than any I, I have seen previously in that when I uh, broke open the tooth, there were still, um, I, I guess the best word to say is, is plump blood vessels still present inside the tooth. Okay. And uh, what steps did you take in that DNA testing? Uh, I performed the same process as described earlier. The only difference is... Um, I had to use uh, forceps, fancy name for tweezers, to peel those blood vessels out um, because bones are treated differently than other types of tissue, so I needed to separate those and process them differently. Okay. And how did you, did you process both those items? I did. And were you able to generate a, a DNA profile for those items? I was. 
And between the molar and those vessels, were those items, were those profiles identical? They were. Okay. Did you compare that sample against any other known samples? I did. That sample was compared against a sample from a Mr. Dennis Trahan. Okay. Um, and w what were the results of that comparison? Uh, again, I was looking to see if Mr. Trahan could be a biological parent of the deceased individual. Um, I performed the same statistical calculations. Um, and so for, I couldn't exclude him from being a biological parent. And for the locations of DNA examined, um, the single parentage index um, was 5,628,000, um, excuse me, 602,000. Um, and the probability um, of exclusion, other um, men would be excluded from being the bi biological father, was 99.9999%. Okay. And did you put that information in a lab report? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the state has no further questions at this time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Any cross-examination? No, Your Honor. All right. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Is the witness allowed to be excused? Yes, Your Honor. No objection. All right. The witness may be released. Also, thank you for your testimony today. The bailiff will help uh, you be escorted off the bench to the out of the court. Thank you. Uh, in terms of scheduling, I'll inquire of the state. Do you want to get another witness started at this time or perhaps look at the lunch break? I think it would be a good time to start the lunch break, Your Honor. Okay. We will go ahead and take our lunch recess then. We will plan on starting back up uh, by no later than 1245. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Let's have the uh, jurors brought in, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. <clears throat> okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. The state's continuing with its case in chief. The jurors are all present and accounted for, properly seated. Uh, the defense is here as well as the defendant and the prosecution. Uh, counsel, just before we get started here, I wanted to discuss briefly the scheduling we have. Uh, we'll need to uh, be done today by 3.20 instead of 3.30, just so counsel's aware. And then in terms of tomorrow, uh, we've determined we're going to have a shortened schedule tomorrow. We're going to go from 8.30 until 1.30 tomorrow, and we're not going to do a full lunch break, but we will provide um, something during one of the breaks for the jurors to have something so they don't have to go clear till 1.30 without lunch. So that's going to be the schedule for this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, Mr. Wood, then, 
I believe when we left off, we needed to have a, another witness called at this time. Is that correct? Yes, the state would call Katie Dace. Okay. All right, before uh, you get started with your direct, Mr. Wood, let me just inquire of the witness briefly. Uh, have you at any time viewed any of the trial testimony in this case, either through online uh, exposure to that, looking it up or reading it anywhere? No. Okay, thank you for your response there. Uh, while you're testifying, please make sure to talk directly into the microphone. Please make verbal responses to any questions so we can keep the record clear and avoid talking at the same time as anyone asking you a question. So with that in mind, Mr. Wood, you can inquire on your direct. Thank you. Ms. Dace, could you state your name and spell your last name for the record? My name is Catherine Dace, D-A-C-E. What is your occupation or profession? I am a forensic biologist and supervisor with the Idaho State Police Forensic Services in Meridian, Idaho. Okay. And how long have you been employed by the Idaho State Police Forensics Lab? Since 2016. Okay. Is that the first forensics lab you've worked at? No. What other labs have you worked at? I began my career in 2008 with the Denver Police Department in Denver, Colorado. I worked there for approximately four years. After that, I went to work for a military contractor performing DNA services overseas for approximately one year. Uh, after that, in 2014, I went to work for the Texas Department of Public Safety in Austin, Texas. And then in 2016, I came to Idaho. Would you describe your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree in forensic biology from West Virginia University. Okay. Um, and did your formal in education include the study of DNA? It did. Uh, did that education include hands-on work with DNA testing techniques? It did. Are you certified by any boards? Yes, I am certified by the American Board of Criminalistics in Molecular Biology. Okay. And what are your duties and responsibilities at the Idaho State Police Forensics Lab? As a forensic scientist, my job is to examine items of evidence for the presence of biological fluids and materials, uh, attempt to generate DNA profiles from those items, and then make comparisons to known samples. As a supervisor, my job is to supervise other employees and manage budgets and things like that. Okay. Did you receive evidence in the case of the state of Idaho versus Lori Vallow? I did. And is that identified in your lab by the number M2020-2233? It is. Okay. Um, what evidence did you receive in this case? I received autopsy samples from J.J. Vallow to include hand swabs, nail swabs, oral swabs, rectal swabs, and penile swabs. I also received tape and plastic from the body and burial site. Uh, I received some swabs from an apartment, uh, 565 Pioneer 175. I received a uh, chain and pendant, and I also received 18 hand tools from a garage slash barn at the Daybell property. Uh, lastly, I received a few reference samples as well. Okay. I, did you mention receiving bags? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's talk about those real quick. Uh, did you ever find, were you, were, were you ever able to locate um, or generate a DNA profile from any material on any of the bags you were provided? The bags from the burial site? Yes. 
No. Okay. Um, did you ever do any testing on any duct tape? I did. Can you tell us what type of testing you did? Yes, I received duct tape from the hands, ankles, and mouth, and then duct tape with a plastic bag from around the head and tape and plastic that the body was wrapped in. Um, I examined these items with the latent print examiner at the same time, and most of the tape and plastic had uh, apparent blood and decomposition fluid present, so I tested all those items for blood, which was positive. Um, as far as DNA testing goes on the tape, uh, I was looking at the tape ends for any irregular edges that could maybe indicate that someone had torn the tape uh, with their teeth and left behind saliva. So I did swab a couple areas uh, of that. And then lastly, I assisted Tara, the latent print examiner, with uh, collecting hairs and fibers uh, from the tape. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You, you said that some of that tested, some of that fluid tested positive for blood. It did. And where was that located specifically? Um, really all over the surface of everything, um, all over the surface of the tape and the plastic. Did you do any DNA testing on that? No. Okay. How come? Uh, it was pretty clear it was decomposition fluid from the victim, and um, at this point we were trying to identify DNA that might be from the perpetrator, so it was not of evidentiary value. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, a chain and pendant that you received. Did you test those for the presence of blood? I did. Okay, and were you able to find any blood on those? No, they were negative. Okay. Um, and you mentioned uh, some swabs from apartment 175. Yes. Uh, tell us uh, what you did with those items. There was a swab from a knife, and I tested that for blood, and it was negative. There was also a swab from a wall, and I tested that, and it was extremely weak positive, presumptively, for blood. And that uh, was all the testing I did on those items. Okay. Ms. Dice, I want to talk to you about some of the tools you received. Do you recall uh, what tools you received? Yes, there were uh, 18 hand tools. It was a variety of shovels, a pickaxe, a pair of shears, a post hole digger, and several hand saws. Okay. And did you do any type of testing on these tools? I did. Uh, overall, what type of testing did you do with those tools? Uh, I, I was looking for blood and potential uh, human remains, so I did do blood testing on, on the tools, and then I also um, examined, examined the surfaces for anything I thought that could be biological. Okay. Uh, did you find anything to be con that you considered to be of evidentiary value? Yes. I found several presumptive positive blood stains on the tools, and um, on several of the tools, I thought I found what could be charred flesh. Okay. Um, and what did you do with, with those tools specifically? So um, I photographed them and collected what I found, and then I selected four samples of the potential flesh to run for DNA testing. Prior to that, I took photographs of that material with a stereo microscope to get a better visual sample or visual representation, and then I took portions of each of those for DNA analysis. Can you tell the jury what a stereo microscope is? It's a version of a microscope that is for items you can already see with the naked eye, unlike other microscopes where you're maybe looking at things that are otherwise invisible. Um, so in this case, what I was looking at, I could already see, uh, but you could not see, you know, very clearly. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 201A through 201Q. Ms. Stace, do you recognize, or will you take a moment and look through State's Exhibit 201A through 201Q, and when you're done, let me know when, when you're done reviewing it. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. 
Do you recognize States Exhibits 201A through 201Q? I do. What do they purport to be? Um, they are photos I've taken during my examinations. And are these photos that you took yourself? Yes. And uh, are they true? Well, what are they, what are they photos of? There are photos of the tools that I examined, some of the material I collected from the tools, and some of the material under the stereoscope. And then the last photo is of some hairs from the tape. Okay. Uh, are these true and accurate representations of the photographs you took? They are. Your Honor, I'd ask that States Exhibit 201A through 201Q be entered into evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. May I vote here and aid? Yes. <clears throat> so on each one of these photographs, Ms. Dace, there are uh, writings and some annotations. Did you superimpose those onto these photographs? Yes. Okay. So when he says, are these true and accurate photographs of what were taken, they are true and accurate to the extent that they hadn't been altered by this photoshopping or this superimposing other things on top? No. Um, all of these labels were made using Microsoft Paint. <laughs> okay. But you superimposed them onto the photographs? Yes. Okay. With that explanation, Your Honor, I have no objection. All right, thank you. Mr. Thomas, the exhibits 201A through Q are all admitted. Oh, sorry. Ms. Dace, if I speak about item 36.4, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, it is one of the shovels. Is that a, a number that was the, your lab assigned to that tool? Yes, there were several tools in one bag, and that was item 36, and so each tool received a sub-item, one through five. Okay, so tell me about um, item 36.4. It was a shovel that I examined, and on the um, blade of the shovel I identified material I thought I might want to run for DNA. Okay. Your Honor, may I publish to the jury? Yes. Do you recognize that photograph? Yes, that is my photo. Uh, what is that a photograph of? A shovel. Is that item 36.4? Yes. Okay. Um, what are what are some of the uh, these things that have been superimposed? What does I'm, that mean? Oh, I am outlining areas that I sampled, uh, that I swabbed. So in addition to looking for blood or uh, biological remains, I was also swabbing the tools um, for preservation. Okay. Can you describe uh, what we're seeing in State's Exhibit 201B? That is a close-up photo of the blade of the shovel, and that is circling in the light blue what I collected. Okay. And State's, what, what do you observe in State's Exhibit 201C? In the previous photo, you could see the area that I circled. This is what I collected off of it, um, and this is under the stereoscope, uh, stereo microscope. Um, and then the blue box is outlining the portion that I took for DNA analysis. Okay. Were you able to generate a DNA profile from that material? I was not. Okay. Can you tell me about State's Exhibit? Or, I'm sorry. Lab item 36.5. It is another shovel. Okay. Can you tell me what you observe in State's Exhibit 201D? 
Um, it is a shovel that is item 36.5. Okay. And did you do any, any type of testing on this? Yes, I also collected some material that I photographed under the stereoscope and uh, ran for DNA. Okay. Uh, what was it about that material that, um, that caught your attention? When I'm looking at these shovels and you're looking at dirt and some of the shovels had uh, what appeared like ashes on them, these um, fragments had a different appearance. Um, they did not look like something that's normally in dirt. They looked like they could possibly be flesh. Um, but it's difficult to know when you had a body subjected to fire. So um, I simply photographed them and then attempted DNA to see if it would work. And what do you observe in States Exhibit 201E? The line on the right side of the photo is uh, pointing at what I saw when I had brushed away some dirt. And that material that's kind of a pinkish tan color is what I collected. Okay. And what do you observe in States Exhibit 201F? This is the piece of that material that I ran for DNA, and this is the photo of it underneath the stereo microscope. Were you able to obtain a DNA profile from that uh, sample? I was not. There's a, a blue box. What does that represent? That is the portion that I took for DNA. The remainder um, was not consumed for DNA. Can you tell me about states or lab item number 36.1? Yes, it is a pickaxe from that bag of tools. Okay, let me circle back. I'm going to actually ask you about uh, item 36.3 first. Okay. It is a shovel from that same bag of tools. Okay. Can you tell me what you observe in States Exhibit 201G? This is a photograph that I took of the tool, um, and it is labeled 36.5. Okay, and... Or, excuse me, 36.3. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, if anything, uh, did you do with this tool? Again, I looked for blood and collected um, debris and other material from the blade of the shovel. What do you observe? What do you observe in States Exhibit 201H? This is a photo of the back side of the blade of the shovel, and that circled area represents um, some material I collected for DNA testing. Okay. Why did you collect that? It uh, had a somewhat soft texture, and um, again, seemed like it could possibly be um, biological remains. Okay. And what do you observe in States Exhibit 36, or I'm sorry, States Exhibit 201I? That is a photograph of that material on the back of the shovel, um, now removed from the shovel and taken by itself. And what do you observe in States Exhibit 201J? This is a photograph of that material underneath the stereo microscope. And the area outlined with the blue box indicates the portion that I took for DNA testing. OK. And uh, there's something labeled green material. Do you know what that is? I do not. OK, so you didn't test that material? No. Does the Idaho State Forensic Lab, do you test any materials? Like trace analysis? Yes. We do not have a trace section at our laboratory. Okay.
In regards to item 36.3, were you able to obtain a DNA profile? I was. Um, how did you do that? Uh, DNA testing begins with identifying a sample that you want to run for DNA. I then take a portion of that sample and put it into a tube with unique case identifiers on it. I then break open all the cells to release the DNA. Uh, and then I determine how much DNA is present in the sample called quantification. From there, we copy the specific locations of DNA that make our forensic DNA profile. And I then visualize those copies, which look like peaks on a graph. Once I have my DNA profiles for a case, I can begin to make my comparisons. Okay. During, <coughs> did you receive any known DNA profiles prior to your testing? Yes. Who did you receive known DNA profiles for? For, for me specifically, I received uh, a sample from Chad Daybell, a sample from Melanie Gibb, and a sample from Richard Mao. The laboratory itself also received other reference samples. Okay, and did, did you receive any other known samples from within your lab? Yes, um, from J.J. Vallow, from Tylee Ryan, from um, Lori Vallow, and I believe um, Dennis Trahan. Okay, so this item. Dennis Trahan. I'm going to put this back up. This item uh, in 201J was located on the back of that shovel. After you obtained a DNA profile, did you compare it to any other known profiles? I did. Uh, did you find any match? Or uh, what, what did your comparison show? The DNA profile obtained from item 36.3.5 matched that obtained from the reference sample of Tylee Ryan. This DNA profile is at least 604 octillion times more likely to be seen if Tylee Ryan is the source than if an unrelated, randomly selected individual from the general population is the source. Okay. Can you say that number one more time? 604 octillion. How many zeros is octillion? 27. Okay. <clears throat> Can you tell me about lab item 36.1? It is a pickaxe from that bag of tools. Okay. Can you tell me what you observe in States Exhibit 201K? This is a photo of the pickaxe that I took and is labeled 36.1. And what, what, if anything, did you do with this tool? I tested it for blood and also examined um, debris and foreign material that I collected from the eye of the pickaxe. And can you tell the jury what you observe in State's Exhibit 201L? This is a photograph of the head of the pickaxe. The circle in the center is referred to as the eye of the pickaxe. And when examining it, there was brown colored dirt present, which you see on the left side of the photo that was on the outside. And then when that was removed, there was a much darker material present um, around the eye uh, in that area, which I collected, and that's more in the center of the photograph. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 2010. Oh. Is that the same pickaxe? Yes, it's a close up of that material still present on the eye um, that you can see kind of, you know, where it was located. I'm going to go back to States Exhibit 201L. And perhaps you already answered it, but can, what was the difference between, I'm going to point at this material here and this material there? The material on the left looked more like dirt. 
Um, that's not anything that's a scientific conclusion that's apparent, that appears visual, visible to me. Um, and then the material in the center was very dark and it was very, uh, it had an oily texture. When it was removed from the eye of the pickaxe, the metal uh, ring appeared to have kind of a dark, greasy ring around it. And then in the material were some larger fragments. Tell me what you observe in State's Exhibit 201N, as in November. These are the larger pieces of fragments that I removed from that dark kind of black material from the eye of the pickaxe. And then at the, the bottom, that blue line is pointing to the piece that I selected to photograph and run for DNA. Can you tell me what you observe in State's Exhibit 201P? <laughs> this is a view of that material underneath the stereo microscope, and the blue box represents the area I ran for DNA. Were you able to obtain a DNA profile from that subject matter? I was able to obtain a partial DNA profile from this item. And what do you mean by a partial DNA profile? For a DNA profile, we look at 24 locations, and there are times when we do not have enough DNA or the DNA is degraded, and we get results for just some of the locations, and that's referred to as a partial DNA profile. All right. And are you still able to do a comparative analysis with a partial DNA profile? For this partial profile, yes. Okay. And is it, uh, sci is it accepted in the scientific community uh, to do a comparative analysis with a partial profile? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, what what were the result? Well, what known samples did you compare this against? I compared it against the known samples previously mentioned from this case. Okay. Uh, so. Can you just say it again for the record, which names yes. those would be? Um, well, so in this case, the uh, DNA profile obtained was a female. So uh, in that case, we would just make comparisons to the female references. So I compared it to Lori Vallow and Tylee Ryan and... I believe, I'm not sure if at this time we had the reference sample from Melanie Gibb, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, from your comparative analysis, did you come to any conclusions? Yes. What were those? Um, Tylee Ryan is a potential contributor to this partial DNA profile. This DNA profile is at least 159 trillion times more likely to be seen if it originated from Tylee Ryan than if it originated from an unrelated, randomly selected individual from the general population. Did you do any other testing on item 36.1? Yes, there were some stains that uh, tested presumptively positive for blood on the handle. Okay. Can you describe uh, what you observed in State's Exhibit 201M? These are the two areas that tested positive, or two of the areas that tested positive um, on the handle. What did they test positive for? Uh, blood. Okay. And were you able to do any further testing on those samples? Yes, I swabbed those samples and um, ran the entire swab for DNA. Okay. Uh, were you able to obtain a DNA profile from those samples? I was. Okay. Uh, did you do that in the same manner in which you've described preparing a DNA profile before? Yes. Okay. Uh, and were you, you were able to obtain a profile? Yes. Uh, did you do any comparative analysis with that profile against other known profiles? I did. Uh, what was the conclusion? Were you able to reach a conclusion? Um, the DNA profile from item 36.1.3 matched that obtained from the reference sample of Tylee Ryan. Again, this DNA profile is at least 604 octillion times more likely to be seen if Tylee Ryan is the source than if an unrelated, randomly selected individual from the general population is the source. Okay. 
Ms. Stace, you talked earlier about examining duct tape. Yes. Is there a hierarchy of testing? And maybe that's not the best way to say it. Is there a priority of different types of forensic testing for an item such as duct tape? Yes, and it depends on the specific case. However, when you are looking at duct tape that was attached to a person, it's very likely to find their DNA, and it can be very difficult to find DNA from someone else since the duct tape itself is going to take the DNA from the skin it was touching or the clothing that it was touching. Especially with the presence of blood and decomposition fluid, the chances of getting a foreign DNA profile were quite low. And in this case, I only swabbed a few of the tape ends for saliva and then left the rest of the tape for latent print analysis. Okay. Ms. Stace, are you familiar, are you aware if any items that you collected were ever sent to any other labs for further testing? I believe some of the trace we collected from the tape was sent to another laboratory. Okay. Can you tell me what you observe in States Exhibit 201Q? These are some of the hairs that were collected from the tape from the plastic and duct tape that the body was wrapped in. So this is the black bag and duct tape that were on the exterior of JJ, correct? Yes. Okay. So it wasn't the duct tape wrapped around his arms? Correct. Okay. Is there a pointer up there? Is this a pointer? So it's hard to see through the projector. On the yellow sticky pad marked as B, is there a hair on there? Yes. It is on the top half of the piece of paper, and it kind of goes like that. Okay. And is that a hair that you collected? Yes. Okay. Were you able to test that hair? No. Okay. Are you aware if that hair was sent to any other lab for testing? Yes. It was sent to Bodie Labs. Okay. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, the State has no further questions at this time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Thomas, cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. That's okay. Now they're definitely not in order. Ms. Dace, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. So it looks like you are currently a forensic biologist with the ISP lab. Is that right? That's correct. All right. And I got some of your work history. It looks like you worked at the Texas Department of something. Which department did you work at? Texas Department of Public Safety in Austin, Texas. And what did you do for them? The same thing. I was an analyst, so I processed items of evidence and generated DNA profiles. Okay. Similar to the work you do at the ISP lab? Correct. And is that the Texas version of the ISP lab? Yes. Okay. Good. 
And you do supervisory work at the ISP lab? Yes, since 2020. Okay. Um, but you also do analysis, or is that no longer, you, do, you don't anymore do analysis, or is that part of your job? I well? still do it, yeah. We're a pretty small lab. Okay. All right. Um, looks like you received some uh, autopsy samples, uh, some tape and some plastic, and the state uh, kind of walked you through a lot of that. I'm, I'm a little bit interested in the hair that you found. Uh, do you recall which sample you found that hair on? The the hair that was in the picture just a minute ago? Yeah, and the, on the little yellow sticky Yes, note. that was, I believe, from... Um, 11.8, so the piece of tape 8 from item 11. Okay. And you don't know where that came from on the uh, plastic or wherever? That that just came to you as a piece of tape? No, it came to us. Some of the tape was still on the plastic. However, um, <coughs> the latent print examiner did that deconstruction, so she um, would probably be able to better answer that question. So it first went to the latent print examiner, and then it went to you? Yeah, when we received it, it was in the latent print lab, and um, we did open it together, but uh, some of the tape had to be um, unstuck from itself, and that's a slow process. So I was not in there for the whole thing. So I would come back and help when she was ready, and, um, and then a lot of times the tape was already um, taken apart and set up. Okay. And is that, is that Ms. Martinez? Yes. Okay. And so... Um, how, how long did that process take of taking the tape apart? And then when you, I guess what I'm asking, let me just start over. When was it that you saw the hair on the tape? Was that something that was brought to your attention or was that something that you brought to Tara's attention or Ms. Martinez's attention? It was simply part of our examination process. So before she, uh, before the tape needed to go for latent processing, we wanted to remove what we could. So um, once the tape was was unstuck and ready to be examined. Um, I believe we went through it together, but I know that I was looking at each piece of tape and pulling off any hairs or fibers that I thought um, could be collected. Mm -hmm. And how did this tape come to you? Was it kind of in a ball or was it just layered or how? I mean, when you're saying you had to unstick some of yeah. this stuff. Yeah. Um, it was inside an autopsy bag, so the medical examiner's bag, and I believe most of the tape was still stuck to the bag in a way that indicated it probably had been received that way from the burial site, so it hadn't been all taken off. Um, I think a few pieces may have come loose, but those photographs were all taken uh, by Tara. Okay. And so inside the autopsy bag... You said there was like some fluid, loose fluid and things floating around in there. Is that right? Or was I, yes. was I mistaken? Yeah. Okay. And so that's where this tape was as well? Yes. And the black plastic. And the black plastic. So the autopsy bag wasn't the black plastic bag. Correct. It's a black autopsy bag containing black plastic and the tape. I see. Okay. And so floating within this black autopsy bag, and when you say bag, autopsy bag, it's, it's a body bag. Is that what I'm thinking? Yes. Okay. All right, so probably six feet long, and it's got a zipper on it, you unzip it, yes. and inside there is all the stuff that was floating around. Correct. Okay. So is it possible that this hair could have been part of that stuff that was floating around and got stuck on some of that tape? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, you identified a couple of shovels that you thought might have DNA on it, and then you tested it and weren't able to get a profile, right? Yes, 36.4 and 36.5. Okay. And then you did uh, DNA on one, and you got a match on a small particle that had Tylee's DNA on it, right? Correct. Okay. And when you, when you get these big numbers of the possibility that it could be somebody else, um, that's based on a formula that you generate? Yes. Okay. And so do you know what the current state of the, uh, how do I want to say this, the DNA population that has been collected? Do you know the current state of that? Well, how, many, how many DNA samples we have or that you have to, to use in that? There is a population um, database 
that was generated by the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and that is what we use. Right. And do you know how many, how many samples are in there? I know my sample's not in there. No, it's not. Uh, uh, it's from known individuals who participated in the study. I believe it's around 1,700. 1,700? Yes. Okay. 1,700? I believe so, yes. Okay. Around, it's, I don't think it's exactly 1,700, but it's right around there. Right. And you're basing that on, <clears throat> um, on a number, and there's a separate one if someone was Native American, right? They would have to go into a separate database or there is a separate, uh, how do I say, a separate formula for people that are Native American, right? For some of the really small populations, um, there are separate databases that more accurately represent the DNA um, frequencies of their population. Right. And so you don't know if Tyler Ryan is part uh, Native American? No, we only perform those calculations uh, by request. So we don't know uh, the ethnicity of anyone in our case until, unless someone were to um, ask us. Right. That. Yeah. Okay. So your calculations are basically based on this formula, which is kind of taken from these 1,700 people that have put their database in or their or their DNA into the database. It's actually not in any sort of, it's not a database the way you'd think of in terms of a law enforcement database. It's, it's a research, uh, sample set. And everyone in that database is a self-identified race. So there's Caucasian, um, Hispanic, and African American. And those are the three main ones. And if there were something different, like, uh, Native American, that is a separate database set. Okay. And you ran tallies off of the, Caucasian database set. So it actually runs off of all three, and we report the most common statistic or the lowest statistic. And in this case, that would be for Caucasian. Okay. All right. Um, and when did you run these tests on uh, these DNA samples that you found on the shovel? When was that, when was that run? I would need to refer to my notes to see those dates. Sure, you want to do that? Yes, please. All right, we'll have the record reflect. The witness is being shown her notes. You can hand those to her, Mr. Bailiff. Thank, Thank you. So for um, 36.1.5 and 36.3.5, my report is dated in April of 2021. Okay. And were you ever in contact with the FBI with regards to um, things that may need to be sent to other labs like the FBI lab or those kinds of things? No. No? Okay. Um, did you think about possibly telling someone that you found or, or – I guess I, I guess I need to know the thought process. There was some testimony earlier today where somebody testified to the fact that they didn't get any tools to make a tool mark uh, analysis. Would this would this be something that you would, if you found evidence of DNA on a particular tool, that you would forward on to somebody else? No, we only report our results back to the submitting agency. Okay. And then it's on that submitting agency, the, the police department or the sheriff's department or the prosecutor, whoever submitted that, to follow through and, and submit that to somebody else. Yes. In this case, the tools did remain in our laboratory uh, pending permission to consume um, that the potential blood stain that was on the handle of the pickaxe. And so um, pending that decision-making, the tools did stay in our custody. Okay. All right. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. I didn't need to use these. And in addition, if you want to collect your notes once you've done that, thank you. Thanks. Any redirect? Just very briefly. 
Ms. Stace, uh, both defense counsel and I have spoke to you about a hair that was collected from uh, tape that was sent to another lab. Yes. Did that hair receive any identifying number? It was 11.16.8B. 11.16.8B. Okay. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. No follow-up. All right. That'll conclude the testimony of this witness then. Uh, I don't, is the witness here under subpoena? And if so, can she be released? She can be released, Your Honor. We have no objection. Okay. Thank you for your testimony this afternoon. I'll have the bailiff help escort you out of the courtroom. State can call its next witness. State would call Tara Martinez. And judge, before while she's being brought in, can we ask for a sidebar? Yes. Let's have the uh, witness brought forward then to be sworn. Okay. All right. We will accommodate any assistance you need getting up here, the bailiff, so please take your time. Before we begin the uh, testimony here, let me just inquire of the witness briefly. Have you previously reviewed any of the trial testimony in this case, either by listening to it from any source or by viewing any of the viewing locations here no, or sir. reading any of it? No, sir. Okay. Thank you for that. So with that in mind, uh, in your testimony, please make sure to make verbal responses to any questions so we keep the record clear. Please try to avoid speaking at the same time of anyone that's questioning you. With that in mind, then... Ms. Smith, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you can do so. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Will you introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please, and um, spell your last name? Yes, my name is Tara Martinez, M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z. Okay. Ma'am, how are you employed? I work for Idaho State Police Forensic Services. Okay. What is your title? Forensic Scientist 2. Okay. And what do you do as a forensic scientist at the lab? So I'm in the latent print section, so that means I process items of evidence to develop latent prints, and then I compare those fingerprints, and then I respond to crime scenes. Okay. How long have you been at the Idaho State Lab? Seven years. Okay. Do you have any special training to do your job duties? Yes, I first have a Bachelor's of Science in Biological Science with a minor in Chemistry and a specialization in Forensic Science. And then I also went through a very extensive training program with the Idaho State Police Forensic Services, which included mock courts, uh, testing, uh, both written and verbal, as well as uh, exercises. And I also had some external training. Okay. And I, I forget, I, I didn't, I don't know if I heard, forgive me, where did you graduate? California State University, East Bay. Okay. Um, and are you a member of any professional organizations related to your job? Yes, the International Association for Identification. I'm also a member of their Pacific Northwest Division. Okay. Now, um, you earlier said that you process latent prints. I process items of evidence to develop latent prints or in hopes of de developing latent prints. Okay. What is a latent print? A latent print, latent means unseen. So a latent print is something that generally you can't see on a surface and is left unintentionally. So if I'm touching this desk here, I might accidentally leave a print behind. That would be a latent print. Now, what is um, the process used to develop a latent print um, in your examinations? 
So it depends on the item. When I get an item into our laboratory, I'll first look at what is the item made out of, meaning um, is the item porous or non-porous. So like water bottles and glass and things like that are non-porous, meaning they don't absorb water, whereas porous would be the paper. So I'd look at things like that to see what kind of surface this is. Then I would look at maybe the texture of the item, the color of the item, and these things would help me figure out what process would be most successful. Okay. Um, now, do people always leave latent prints? No. It depends on a variety of factors. First and foremost is you individually. Some people just have better skin to leave latent prints. Maybe they uh, sweat a little bit more. Maybe they produce more amino acids. And so they're therefore able to leave better prints um, and more frequently leave prints behind. And then also the surface makes a big difference. Is it dusty? Is it dirty? Um, that Those kinds of surfaces won't generally leave latent prints behind. Uh, and then is the item textured? So all of these things factor into if you'll leave a latent print behind. If a latent print uh, is left behind, um, how is it you would collect a latent print? So on a typical non-porous item like, you know, water bottle, you know, metal, things like that, uh, I first look at the item unaided, just my normal eye, to see if I see any latent prints that maybe are left behind in a little sweat. Um, if I don't see anything, then I'll move forward and I'll look with an alternate light source, which is just a different, gives you different colors of light, Try again, to see if anything's left behind. Then I'll actually start the real processing, which starts with cyanoacrylate fuming or superglue fuming. And basically the superglue vaporizes into the air, becoming a gas, and it attaches into the uh, lane print. It just attaches to the moisture in your print. So because prints are a lot of water, the glue likes to attach to the print. After that, I do a dye stain, which is generally um, generally makes the whole item stain, but again, it's more attracted to the glue prints because they're a different texture than the rest of the item. And then once that's done, I powder the item. So that's kind of like a general for like a non-porous item. So um, when you talk, when a lot of us think of um, fingerprinting as just dusting it with some powder. It sounds like there are multiple other steps. Yes, dusting is one way to do it, but there are a lot of different techniques depending upon the item and what you're trying to look at. Okay. If any of those processes work and you're able to sort of have a latent print appear, how do you go about comparing it to someone or something? So the methodology is ACE-V. Each letter stands for something. So the first is A for analysis. So I have this print. I've developed it from processing. And I'm looking at the print overall to see, first, do I know what area of skin this print is from? Uh, is it from the palm of your hand or is it from a fingertip? Stuff like that. And then I'll look at it to see what kind of distortion it has. Every print is going to have a little bit of distortion. So I'm going to see, is it smeared? Is it um, spotty? Things like that. And then I'll look at, um, overall, do I think this print has value for comparison? Do I think it has enough information to be able to move on to the next step? And so the next step would be C, stands for comparison. And at that point, I'm doing the back and forth between the unknown print, meaning the lean print, and the known print. And I'm comparing the two to see the details in the unknown print, do they match the known print? Or do they not match the known print? And so I'm going back and forth to see, are the details similar? Do they Are they spaced the same? Do they appear to look the same? And then after that, I go to E, which is evaluation. So at that point, I'm saying, do I think that these two came from the same source, the unknown and the known? Or do I think they didn't come from the same source, and I can exclude the two? Or third option would be, do I not have enough information to say either way? Is the print going to be inconclusive? And then at that point, I'm done with what I'm doing. And then the V stands for verification. So another analyst comes behind me and starts the process all over again. Okay. So just so that I'm clear, because there was a lot there. All right. Um, it, so analysis, you look at the latent print to see if it's of sufficient quality to compare to something. Yes. All right. And then you do a comparison. Yes. All right. So if you have a latent print left of an object... How would you find something to compare it to? Generally, that information comes from the agency. They'll let us know 
these are the persons that could be involved in this case, and then I can get the fingerprints, the known prints from them directly, or I could get them through our database. So it just depends. Okay, so when you say known prints, that's prints that someone took from someone who had an ID on them or have been identified with a particular person. Yes. Okay, and so you take the unknown that's on a surface and you compare it to known people that you have prints for. Yes. And you said something about a database. What do you mean a database? Yes, so there's a few different databases we use. Um, they're law enforcement databases, and the people could be in the database for a variety of different reasons. And so we can generally pull prints from that database uh, to help us with our comparison. Okay. Do you also sometimes go out and get prints from individuals so that you have copies as well? Yes. Okay. And then the, the um, evaluation process, was that the E? That is the E. Okay. And um, that is where you look at them to see whether you believe there's they're a match. Yes. Okay. And then verification process, that's when somebody else basically double checks your work? Yeah, they start from the beginning. So they start, they do their own analysis, their own comparison, and then they uh, have to do their own evaluation, and then they have we have to come to some agreement. Okay. So um, let's turn to your lab. I believe it's 2020, and then the numbers are 2233. Are you familiar with that lab number? Yes. Okay. Is that the lab number associated with Chad Daybell, Lori Vallo, J.J. Vallo, and Tylee Ryan? Yes. Okay. What was your first contact, if any, with that lab number? My first contact was we were requested, myself and someone else was requested from our laboratory to assist uh, Rexburg Police Department at the coroner's office to help uh, obtain prints from J.J. Vallow. Okay. And did you go to the coroner's office and get J.J.'s fingerprints? Yes. Okay. Did you have any other contacts with that um, case? Yes. I later went to both Rexburg, Rexburg and St. Anthony to obtain fingerprints, Foot ex footprints or foot exemplars, uh, buckle swabs, and hair samples from Lori uh, Vallow and Chad Daybell. Okay. Um, so you they, you got fingerprint samples and samples that could be used in DNA. Yes. All right. Those would be their known prints and their known DNA sample. Yes. All right. Did you also obtain any known samples from Alex Cox? I obtained known samples, um, not myself. So I, I got some through two different means. The first was uh, the FBI database, or the they're on file with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a fingerprint card. And then later I received other uh, fingerprints from Gilbert Police Department in Arizona. As a result of Alex Cox's um, uh, autopsy? Yes. So you had two different known samples from Alex Cox? Yes. All right. Um, now, turning to that, in this case, did you actually do do any actual latent print examinations? Yes, I did latent print processing and comparison. Okay. Can you tell us how you came in contact with the evidence that was submitted to the ISP lab in this case? Yes, so I checked out items 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 18, and then I uh, subsequently processed those items to try to develop latent prints. Okay, let's break those down just so that we have a clear picture of what specific evidence you looked at. So item 10, what was your item 10? Item 10 was a white drawstring bag with gray colored duct type tape described from the agency as a bag around head JJ. Okay. Um, so the, it was a white bag that was around JJ, JJ's head. That's what I was told, yes. Okay, and that was identified as lab number 10. Yes. Okay. What was lab number 11? Lab number 11 was a bundle or a mass of plastic bags and gray-colored duct type tape. The, um, the gray-colored duct type tape was labeled by myself as 11.1 through 11.11, .11. And then the bags were labeled 11.12 through 11.15. And these were described by the agency as body bag and plastic, JJ. Okay. So when you say body bag and plastic, was it um, the plastic, a black plastic with gray duct tape on it? Yes, the item that I processed was a black, pieces of black plastic and gray colored duct type tape, but it was submitted to me in a plastic body type bag. And um, 
and you processed that. Um, let's just quickly talk about how you processed it without getting into the late print analysis. What did you have to do so that you could process that item 11, the, the black plastic with the gray duct tape on it? So first, a lot of the duct tape was attached to itself. So to be able to process it fully, both the non-adhesive side or the non-sticky side and then the sticky side, I had to take it apart from itself. So um, all the plastic was pulled apart from the tape and the tape was pulled apart from itself and hairs were collected during that process. And then I proceeded to do the non-porous processing sequence, like I mentioned earlier, but the duct tape, because it has an adhesive side, I added an additional process that targets that area. Okay. Well, there was a couple of things in there I want to make sure I understand. So that the, the tape that was attached to the blast, black pat plastic and identified to you is from body bag, right? Um, you took that tape apart? Yes. Right? You pulled yes. it apart? Yes. Okay. And then um, did you examine the black plastic? Yes, both both were processed for latent prints, both the plastic pieces and the duct tape. They were just pulled apart from one another to be able to process individually. And then in item 11, you indicated something about hairs. Were, you found hairs? Yes, anytime I'm processing an item and I find hairs, even though I don't process hairs, I collect them so that someone else may be able to do so. So I collected hairs in this item and put them back in its original packaging to be used later if needed. Okay, I and mean, so when you say collected hairs, it's hairs off of that black plastic and the duct tape, the, yes. the gray duct tape. Yes. Okay. So um, item 12, um, what was item 12? Item 12 was one piece of gray colored duct type tape said by the agency to have been tape from mouth, JJ. Okay. And what is item 13? Item 13 was one mass of duct type tape, gray again, and that was said to be from ankles of JJ. Okay. And item 14? Item 14 was also a mass of a bunch of duct type tape, and that was said by the agency to be from hands of JJ. Okay. And item 15? I didn't have item 15. I'm sorry, I missed 18. 18. 18. 18 was one green colored Letica Corporation piece of plastic, and that was said from the agency to be uh, bucket bag two of three Tylee. Okay. And what color was that? Green. Okay. So um, item 10, did you process it for the presence of any latent prints? Yes. Okay. Did you develop any usable prints on that white bag um, that was labeled um, JJ head? No. There were no usable prints on item 10? No. Okay. Um, on item 11, that... Um, gray duct tape on the black plastic. Um, did you develop any usable prints on item 11? Yes. Okay. Item 12, did you develop any usable prints on um, item 12, the piece of gray duct tape? I believe you said hands? That was mouth. That was mouth. And was no. Okay. And item 13? Yes, I developed latent prints. Okay, and that was around? Uh, that was around the feet. Of JJ, or said to be. Around, item 13 was around what? The feet, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and item 14? Um, that was the tape around the hands, and I did not develop any latent prints there. Okay. Um, were you able to pull any hairs off of that item 14? I don't recall. I think there was hairs off of all the items, but I'd have to look at my notes to see specifically how okay. many. And were you able to develop any prints off of item 18? No. Okay. So just to be clear, which items did you get usable prints off of? 11 and 13. Okay. Let's talk initially about item 13. Um, uh, were you able to, um, after you developed some prints on item 13, were you able to compare them to any known samples? Yes. Okay. Who's, what knowns did you compare the prints on item 13 to? Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, J.J. Vallow, and Alexander Lamar Cox. Okay. And were you able to uh, reach a definitive conclusion about um, whether they matched any of those individuals? No. Okay. 
And so was there an inconclusive finding? There was an inconclusive finding on both of them for two different reasons. What were those reasons? One was, uh, it's lane print 13.1, and that was because of the quality of the print. Sometimes if the print just is very poor quality and doesn't provide a lot of information, it, it may be pushed through to, I can compare this print, but I just can't be certain on these details and can't re rely upon them. So it ends up being inconclusive due to the quality of the print. The other one was inconclusive because of the area of skin the latent print was thought to have come from. I didn't have good recordings of those areas. So it was inconclusive needing better knowns. Okay. Now, what about item 11? You received usable prints. Were they of sufficient quality that you could do a comparison? Yes. Okay. Um, in anticipation of your trial today, um, did you prepare an exhibit to aid you in explaining where you got those prints uh, to the jury? Yes. Okay. Let me have, Your Honor, if I may, may I have the witness handed State's Exhibit 210, a copy of which has been given to both the court and the defense? Yes. Do you recognize the pictures that are in State's Exhibit 210? Yes. What are they? The first photo is uh, an overall picture I generally take when I first receive the evidence in. So I can take it as uh, to show how the evidence looked before I did any processing. So that's the first photo. And this is showing item 11. Okay. Would you like me to keep moving Yeah, I, okay. we'll have you describe each of them okay. for the record, and then we'll show them all at once if they're admitted and the court permits. Okay. What's the second one? The second photo is of item 11.12, so part of item 11 that has been, I've numbered out instead of just being item 11 with everything. This is 11.12, and the processing is done on the item, and I marked the latent print that I developed. So you can see an overall picture showing that this is where the print was found on the item. And are each of those images fair and accurate um, uh, pictures uh, of what your observations were and of item 11 that you processed at the ISP lab in this in this case? Yes. Your Honor, I move for the admission of State's Exhibit 210. I have one more. Did you want me to look at the last one? Oh, yes. The, the last one is a picture of 11.15. So again, it's a piece of item 11 that was processed, and it shows my marking showing that um, the, where the latent print was developed on this item. With that record, Your Honor, I move for the admission of State's Exhibit 210. Okay, and I just want to make clear, Counselor, before it's admitted and published, there were some modifications from the exhibit to the court's courtesy copy and counsel's, I believe, so... Yes, Judge. Um, two, it should be an exhibit of total of three pages as discussed at sidebar, which would be the cover page and two pages with images shown to defense counsel and the court. Okay. With the exhibit limited to that, which will be submitted as evidence to the jury, is there any objection from the defense? Given that explanation, Your Honor, we have no objection. Okay. Then uh, the exhibit will be admitted. That's 210. Thank you. And permission to d uh, display for the jurors, Judge? You may publish it. Thanks. So the front page of 210 is just a title page, correct? Yes. Your name, your position, and your lab number? Yes. Okay. And moving to the second page of 210, could you describe for the record and for the jurors what we're seeing in the second page of State's Exhibit 210? Yes. So on the left, you're seeing on... Sorry for moving it on you. It's okay. On the left photo, you can see there's two different black uh, bad kind of images. So on the right one, the one that looks like it has handles, that is what I'm calling um, the, you know, the body type bag that the item was delivered in. On the left of that is the black plastic and the duct type tape that is item 11. And that was the actual item that was processed. The um, one Could with you the do handles. me a favor, just a second? Yeah. Um, let's, uh, 
just do me a favor. Um, if you could, could you show the jurors which one you process, please, using the laser pointer yes. that's up there? Of course. So this is the item that was processed, and then this is the item that was not processed. So this is just basically packaging. That's how I used it. Okay. And then... And so just at, let me ask you a question. You were pointing at the picture under which um, the title is called Item 11, correct? Yes. And on the left-hand side of that picture was the item you processed? Yes. And on the right hand of that particular picture was the item you call packaging? Yes. Is that the item that the, item, that the duct tape and the bags came in? Yes. All right. And what about the picture on the right-hand side of the second page? I believe it's labeled Item 11.12. Yes, so uh, this item here, item 11 in its entirety, was multiple pieces of plastic. Um, well, not multiple pieces. I'm sorry. Let me correct that statement. A piece of black plastic with multiple pieces of tape on it. So taken apart, this is the bag in its entirety. Is this picture on the right-hand side? And this is after processing. So what you're seeing here is just the bag part, and it's to show that this print here was marked. So that is print 11.12.1. So when you say the print, that was the print that surfaced after you processed? Yes. Um, very generally, how did you process the item 11 so that um, uh, item, the print 11.12 was visible? So because there was both plastic and tape, I used two different processes. So I did the first process, uh, like I described earlier, where I did visual and then uh, alternate light source visual and then the glue fuming followed by the dye stain, followed by the powder. That's what I did on the bag. On the tape, I did the same thing, but I added a step, which is using a liquid powder that adheres to the adhesive side of the tape to try to visualize prints on the adhesive side. Okay. And I know you said earlier that usable prints were developed. Um, were they developed on what part, part of 11 um, and 11.12? On the plastic portion, not on the duct tape portion. Okay. And um, are we able to see there appears to be some handwriting up in um, the corner of that picture? What is that? This green post-it note here? Yes. yes. That's just my labeling system. I'm adding an additional label because the picture is taken so far away because the item is so large. I added a, a little note there to show. Okay. And then there appears to be some yellow up at the top of the image. Uh, this yes. marking, yes. So the uh, half moon mark is just how we draw our orientation. So for a print, that's my indication of what I think the orientation of the print is. And then I'm just drawing on it to show that that's the latent number. So this particular uh, photo is showing that the latent is kind of angled and the print number is 11.12.1. .1. Okay. And so is that the area on the tape... Uh, on the bag, I apologize, the area on the black plastic where you found a latent print. Yes. Okay. And when you say the orientation, that's the sort of the direction the print was facing or going on that black plastic? Yes. Okay. Um, and so once you were able to develop latent print 11.12, were you able then to take and compare it to any knowns? Yes. Um, did that comparison yield any results? Yes. What were those results? I identified 11.12.1 to the right little finger of the card bearing the name Alexander Lamar Cox. Okay. Were you able on this item to make any more conclusions about latent prints um, uh, on item 11? Yes, I have another latent that was developed on this item. And what was that latent number? 11.15.1. Turning to the third page of your exhibit, what are we looking at? This is a picture of the part of item 11 that um, had fallen off during processing. So it was part of the original bag. And um, this is showing the item after it was done processing, again showing my marking for the latent in this green, yellowy color here. Okay. And what number, I'm sorry, is it? It's kind of far away from me to yep. see. What it's, number um, was that latent identified as? 11.15.1. Okay. Um, and was there sufficient quality to that print for you to be able to do any comparison to that one? Yes. 
Um, what, who did you compare it to? What knowns did you compare it to? Um, but for both prints, I compared to Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, J.J. Vallow, and Alexander Cox. Okay, and did your comparison yield any um, conclusions? Yes, I identified it to the right palm, so this part of your hand in here, um, to Alexander Lamar Cox. Okay, and so um, evaluation of item 11 in the lab, the black plastic with the duct tape yielded two latent prints, Correct. Yes. yes. And both of those latent prints matched the known prints of whom? Alexander Lamar Cox. Okay. One moment, if I may, Your Honor. Yes. And um, just a real quick question. The hairs that you were able to obtain and pull, um, those were um, submitted and retained at the lab for further testing if necessary, correct? Yes. So I repackaged them into their into, into a new coin envelope uh, just to keep them all contained. And then they returned to the original packaging, and that was when I was done with my processing, that went back into the vault for someone else to check out if needed. Okay. Because you don't do hair examination? No. You don't do DNA? No. Nope. And those hairs, however, were collected by you and Ms. Dace and saved for future testing, either at your lab or another lab? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. We have no questions, Judge. Okay. Without any cross-examination, then, that will conclude the witness of this testimony. Uh, may Ms. Martinez be released from any subpoena and excused? Yes. Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. You can be excused then. Thank you. Please uh, take your time. We'll have the bailiff assist you here. And if it helps, suggest the chair. At this point, I think we'll take our mid-afternoon break, given the timing. Again, we need to uh, stop by 3.20 today, so let's try and keep this break uh, as quick as possible. But I know it takes time with our 18 jurors at this point, so hopefully around 15 minutes or so. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, let's have the jurors brought back in. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22-211624. The state continues with, it, with its case in chief. Mr. Wood, if you'd like to call your next witness, you may. The state calls Detective Chuck Concitus. Just briefly, I'll inquire, Detective Concitus, since you last were here testifying, have you reviewed or listened in on or in any way uh, read any of the trial testimony that's occurred since you last were here? No. Okay. Thank you for that response then. Mr. Wood, you can go ahead and proceed with your direct examination. Thank you. Welcome back, Detective. Um, you've 
already been here, but just for clarity of the record, could you state and spell your name, spell your last name for the record? Uh, last name is Consitis, K-U-N-S-A-I-T-I-S. Thank you. Uh, Detective, you've already explained your credentials to the jury uh, and explained that you've been involved with uh, the case of the state versus Lori Ballow, correct? Correct. Okay. Detective, have you, were you present at Chad Daybell's residence on June 9th, 2020? Yes. Uh, did you take part in the search of that property? I did. Uh, at any time, did you uh, aid in uh, the recovery of the remains of Tylee Ryan from what, uh, from that backyard? Yes. Um, that that uh, the area where Tyler Ryan was located uh, was there a name given to that area or was it located? Uh, what were, was there a name given to that area? The pet cemetery. Okay, detective. At any time in your investigation, were you a part of efforts to obtain satellite imagery of Chad Daybell's residence? Yes. Uh, how did? Tell me how that came about. So in late July of 2020, um, as the case was transitioning from a missing person into the homicide investigation, we were still monitoring uh, the social media sites and came across a, a news story out of Salt Lake City off of KSL News. Their reporter uh, was running a story that uh, was centered around... I'll object, Your Honor, to hearsay. Your Honor, it's not coming in for truth of the matter. It's coming in to explain what the detective did next in his investigation. All right. Um, on the, I will overrule the objection, but just indicate that it's for that limited purpose, and so to the extent it's quoting directly what anyone said, try to avoid that in your response, please. I'm sorry? So try to avoid any response that just directly quotes what anyone else said, if you can, oh, in your sure. response. Uh, as part of your investigation, did you see a news story about satellite imagery? I did. Uh, related to the Daybell residence? Yes. Uh, based on what you saw in that news story, um, did you do anything uh, in relation to that investigation? So I followed up on the information that was uh, depicted in that news story and uh, reached out and contacted Apollo Mapping which was um, the satellite company or satellite broker for that story. Okay. And were you, did you request any images from them? We did. Um, we requested any images, uh, I believe, the, from the 1st of August through uh, the end of October uh, for images with high enough resolution that we may be able to pick up details on the surface of the uh, Earth. Did you receive any images from Apollo mapping? Yes, there were four usable images that we obtained. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be uh, shown States Exhibit 142 and 142A. 142 is a business records affidavit uh, that defense was given prior notice of, so I believe that comes in by way of stipulation. All right. Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibit 142? I do. What is it? This is the Certificate of Authenticity for High-Resolution Satellite Imagery from Apollo Mapping. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 142A? I do. What is it? This is a flash drive containing the images uh, of the requested uh, images from Apollo Mapping. Is that flash drive in an envelope? It is. Did you observe the contents of that flash drive? I did this morning. Did you initial that flash drive? I did, and also dated it with today's date. Okay, and did you place that flash drive in that envelope? Yes. Did you seal and sign it? I did. Is the seal intact? It is. Your Honor, uh, the state would move for admission of State's Exhibit 142 and 142A into evidence. Any objection? Your Honor, State's Exhibit 142 does comport to be a 
certificate of authenticity uh, under Rule 902 of the Idaho Rules of Evidence. I do not object. I have not had the time since handed this uh, Exhibit 142A to uh, review it uh, since uh, since we've been in, in trial. But uh, so I'll conditionally not object if the if the exhibit contains other items on there that I may uh, rent, bring up an objection. Okay, I'll keep that possible objection under advisement. Exhibit 142 is the certification it's admitted. 142A will be provisionally admitted, um, I guess pending it being published and making sure that it's not something Defense Council hasn't previously had or has any further objections on. So if you'll just move through things slowly if you do intend to publish it, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, well, well, may I publish, and then I will, I will do so slowly in a manner that defense has a chance to object if needed? Yes. Uh, Detective, uh, when, what did you receive in terms of digital uh, information from Apollo mapping? We received, uh, received uh, the images and the raw data that accompanied them, each photo. Okay. Uh, did it come in a folder like that? It was placed onto a folder like that. It was downloaded over the, over the um, Apollo mapping website. Okay. Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to ask if the defense has any objection. Uh, there's these .tfw files which uh, came with the Apollo mapping, which is the, which is data, and then the actual images, which are these TIF files. <clears throat> All right. It it appears to to be what it claims to be, Your Honor. Okay, so no objection at this point, Mr. Wood. You can continue to publish. You know, I'm going to ask that uh, the witness be handed again. I apologize. He should have kept that. The uh, the business records affidavit. Thank you. Detective, when you received that uh, business records affidavit, did it include information about the photos you received? It did. Uh, can you tell me what um, the information contained about picture uh the date and time of picture, the first picture is? The first picture uh, depicted is given the date of August 27th of 2019 at 1833 hours UTC. That's the coordinated universal time. But when adjusted to Mountain Standard Time, which is the time zone uh, we are currently in, it's you take off six hours, minus six hours, so the time of day is adjusted to 1233 in the afternoon. Okay. Detective, is this that first image? Yes. Okay. I'm going to zoom in. Do you recognize that property? Yes, this is an overhead aerial image of the Chad Daybell residence located at 202 North 1900 East in Rexburg, Idaho. Are there any landmarks that you recognize on that image? Yes. The and if you could use a pointer just to point them out real quick. This is the main Daybell residence. Uh, this is the 1900 East. And this is the uh, detached garage and shop. Um, here is um, a marker. It's a large bush. We have a fire pit right here. 
we have a standing section of fence. It's like a wood fence that's got three or four rungs on it. Uh, it's about maybe 10 feet long, eight to 10 feet long, if I recall. And then right here is a hitching post, which is shaped like an H. It has um, a large diameter post, like, I don't know if it's the same width as like a telephone pole or something. It's, it's kind of a large diameter. And that's the marker. Uh, at the base of that, there's a marker. It was used for the pet cemetery. Detective, can you tell me about the second picture, about the date and time it was taken? The second image was taken on September 2nd, uh, 2019 at 1832 hours UTC. So again, adjusted for Mountain Standard Time, that's 1232 in the afternoon. Detective, is this that second picture? Yes. I'm going to zoom in on it. Is this the same property uh, that you've been speaking about, the Chad Daybell residence? Yes. Okay. And the, the landmarks are the same as you saw before? Yes. Can you tell me about the date and time of the third picture? The third picture uh, was taken on... September 9th, 2019, at 18.32 hours UTC, so adjusted for 12.32 in the, uh, af in the afternoon. And you said that picture was taken September 9th? Correct. Is there anything remarkable about that date in your investigation? Yes, as put into our investigation, we believe that's the time frame, uh, uh, the day that Tylee was uh, killed and buried on the property. I'm going to zoom in. Detective, is this that same property? It is. Uh, it appears there's some cloud cover on that, but is there anything about that picture that stood out to you in your investigation? Yes. So, again, just to reorient, you have the main house, the detached garage and shop. Here is that uh, standing fence section. And then you notice a large, discolored, darkened shape there, right where the immediate area of the pet cemetery marker. Okay. And what what time of day was this picture taken? This was taken at 12:32 in the afternoon, uh, and approximately it was less than an hour. Uh, this picture was taken less than an hour after we know that Alex Cox left the property. Okay. Detective, can you tell me about the fourth picture? The fourth picture was taken on October 25th of 2019 at 1842 hours. So adjusted for Mountain Standard Time. It was 12.42 in the afternoon. Detective, I'm going to zoom in. And is this that same property? It is. Uh, with the same landmarks that you observed before? Yes, the, the residence, the outbuilding. You see the fence, and you also see the hitching post at the pet cemetery marker along with the fire ring and the bush for markers. Okay. One moment, Your Honor. Detective, I'm going to, so this is the same property. I'm going to go back to uh, the picture taken on September 9th and zoom in on that property. In your investigation, was there anything significant about that discoloration you spoke about earlier? That was in the immediate area where we fell tightly. And this picture was taken September 9th, correct? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the state has no further questions at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. 
any cross-examination, Mr. Archibald? Detective, did you ask for all photos from this Apollo mapping company? We did. There were several photos that could have been used, but due to the capabilities of each satellite, how it was explained to me, how they're programmed. So some are for higher resolution, some are for lower resolution. There's different elevations. So the satellite images that use the lower resolution will just pick up topography, like shapes of the mountains and the hills and the layout of the land, where the higher resolutions will depict sharper images that you're able to discern, like a house or a vehicle. And so out of all those images, there was only four that used that high enough resolution for us to. Are these from a satellite that only passes over the property every five or seven days, or is it a stationary satellite that's continually taking pictures of the same place? I don't know. I don't know. I believe that the satellites are moving around. Okay. And orbiting. And so did you send them Apollo mapping a subpoena, or did they just provide these voluntarily? We sent them, well, the images, or are we talking about the? Yeah, the images. We had to purchase the images. So the images totaled about $1,500 to purchase from the company. I see. And so these images, on the September 9th one, in your investigation, you believe this is the day that Tylee was buried on this property? Yes. Do you believe it's the day that she was burned on the property? Yes. Is there any indication in this photo from September 9th of smoke or fire? No. And is this the day that Chad Daybell texted his wife that he's going to have a fire in the backyard? Yes. And when you were out there in June of 2020, was there evidence of a fire the previous fall, if you could tell? No. This fire pit that was there in June of 2020, had it been there for some time? Or was it, or could you tell? I believe it was there for some time. So this fire pit that you observed in June of 2020, was it like for roasting marshmallows or burning limbs from trees, or could you tell? There was evidence that there was debris that was being burned in there, and it also could be used for having a marshmallow roast. Okay. And so in your investigation, have you been able to tell if Tylee was burned there on that property or burned somewhere else and transported to that property? I don't want you to speculate. I'm not going to speculate. I just know when we were removing her remains, there was, you could smell a fuel. So that's what I can speak to. Okay. Any evidence of a fire in the fire pit and then having Tylee's remains dragged over to where you found them? There were pieces of bone fragment and tissue that we collected that were sifted from that fire pit. 
so I, there was something there. Uh, whether to say if they went from the pet cemetery to the fire ring or fire ring to the pet cemetery, I can't answer that. Okay. And the the image that you showed us from September 9th uh, was uh, was that 12:32 in the afternoon. Yes. And a little bit cloudy on that day. A little cloudy. But as far as you could see uh, on that satellite imagery, there was no uh, smoke or fire that you could see. No. All right. Thank you, Detective. Any redirect? Detective, in the photo from September 9th, is the fire pit obscured by clouds? Yes. That's it? All right, thank you. That'll conclude the testimony of this witness then. We'll have the bailiff go ahead and assist you out. Um, I don't know if you want me to inquire if the witness will be excused or is he to remain available in the case? Your Honor, we're just standardly keeping our law enforcement members available in case they need to be recalled later. Very well. Thank you. I don't know if the court wants the envelope that 142A was in. Yes. Could I have a very quick sidebar with counsel here? All right, Ms. Blake, if you'd like, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state will call Samantha Williams. Your Honor, before we get started, I would note that Ms. Williams is a victim in this matter. Very well. Uh, I was made aware of that. I don't believe the exclusionary rule would apply in this case, so I don't need to inquire as to whether or not any of this trial has been observed by this particular witness. So with that in mind, I'll just advise Ms. Williams, if you would please make audible responses, verbal responses to any question, and avoid talking at the same time as anyone questioning you. That will help us keep a clear record. And with that, Ms. Blake, you can inquire on direct. Thank you, Your Honor. Will you please state your name and spell your last name? Samantha Gwilliam, G-W-I-L-L-I-A-M. Are you related to Tammy Daybell? Yes, I am. She's my sister. Do you recall being contacted by law enforcement about a pet cemetery on Tammy and Chad Daybell's property in Idaho? Yes, were you aware if Tammy had a pet cemetery? Yes, I knew she had one. We had seen it when we had gone up to visit. And I would ask that the witness be shown States Exhibit 23A. Um, I have three copies, so one for the court counsel, and then if we can have the witness shown one. And when you talk about a pet cemetery, do you know where it was located on the property? Yes, it was on their property to the side of the red barn. Uh, they had a fire pit that we did have marshmallow roasts at. And there was a fence with a little dog statue next to it. Uh, my niece's uh, dog was buried there, and that's why they put the dog statue on top of it. And that photo that you've been shown, does that appear to be an accurate depiction of the property as you knew it? Yes. And, Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of State's Exhibit 23A. I'm not sure that it was previously admitted. Another witness may have used it. Any objection? No objection. I, I don't believe it was previously admitted, so 23A is now admitted. And if I could um, have permission to publish that to the jury? Yes.
And I think there may be a pointer up there. There is. Can you indicate where you knew the pet cemetery to be located? Right here in this little fence, you can see the little dog statue right at the base. This is the fire pit. And how did you know, or I guess you've indicated that, was it common for Tammy to have a pet cemetery? Yes, um, we all grew up with pets and they were like our family. So when they pass away, we always buried them on our properties. And that property in particular, was, did you know, do you know whether that property is 202, 202 North, 1900 East in Fremont County, Idaho? Correct. Did Tammy love animals? She did. Do you know if she loved them her whole life? Uh, yeah, we always had pets, uh, guinea pigs, she had ducks, um, like the whole gamut. We had all of them. Did animals seem to love Tammy? Yeah. She was a person that was... You know, they were just drawn to her, and she loved taking care of them. Was that the same way with people? Yeah. She was a little bit of an introvert, but she loved people and loved taking care of them. She loved her grandkids. And, Your Honor, I'm going to ask that uh, the witness be shown State's Exhibit 298. I believe defense counsel has already been provided a copy. Do you recognize that photo? Yes, I do. And who is that? It's my sister. And Your Honor, I'd move for the admission of Exhibit 298. Any objection? Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Archibald. When was this picture taken, do you know? It was taken at uh, the wedding of one of her children. Do you know about what year this picture was taken? Um, hold on just a second. Um, was in within the year or two of her passing? Uh, maybe 2017. Yeah, or? probably 2017. I can't remember. All of her children got married quickly. You know, the older kids within a year of each other, and so um, within the same year. So it was all, you know, within a year or two of her passing because she just started having grandchildren. With that foundation, Your Honor, I don't have any objection to the, the exhibit. All right. Could you? Okay. Exhibit 298 is admitted. Thank you. And may I publish it for the jury? Yes. How many children are in your family? Uh, there's five of us kids. Where did Tammy fit in that line? She was the second oldest. And how many brothers? We have three brothers. And you and Tammy were the only girls? Yeah, we were the only sisters. Were you close growing up? Yes, we were only four years apart, and so we were far enough apart we didn't fight and close enough together that we got along really well. <laughs> And did you maintain that closeness as you entered into adulthood? Uh, yes, we uh, talked every day and saw each other every day. And we did um, everything together with our children. And do you recall when Tammy started dating Chad Daybell? Yeah, I do. Did you know him from before? Uh, yes, his family lives in our hometown, and so I went to school with his brothers. Um, he was older than me. He was the same age as my oldest brother, so he was not one that I hung around with, but I knew him. Did you like Chad when she started dating him? Yeah, he was a really nice guy. Did you feel like he treated Tammy well? Yeah, he did. And then they ultimately ended up married? Yeah. And throughout their marriage, did you feel, did you maintain contact with Chad and Tammy? Yes, we were very close. Was Chad, in fact, friends with your husband? Yes. Prior to Tammy moving to Idaho, how close did she live to you? We were two blocks away from each other. How often did you see her? Every day. Do you know how many kids 
Tammy and Chad have together? Yeah, five. And you mentioned earlier Tammy is also a grandmother? Yes. Did Tammy want to move to Idaho? Um, at first, no. Uh, she doesn't like change. And all of her family was there so uh, in, in Springville. So it was uh, not something she wanted to do at first. Do you know whose idea it was for them to move? It was Chad's. Did Tammy work prior to moving to Idaho? Yes, she did. What did she do for work? Um, at the time that they moved, she was the special ed secretary at the high school. And previous to that, she worked at the elementary school as the computer teacher. Was she good with computers? Oh, she was amazing with them. She was the go-to person? She was the go-to person if any of us had a question about something that she could answer it, and she would pick a, up any new software and could figure it out. Uh, she was self-taught and was very smart. And the two jobs you mentioned, she worked closely with children? Yes, she did. When they first got married, do you know what Chad did for work? Um, he was working for the Springville City Cemetery um, for the Parks Department. He was uh, part of the cemetery upkeep crew. They helped prepare um, all the graves, and they took care of the cemetery, you know, upkeep. Was he also involved in ever digging graves that you know of? Uh, yeah, that was part of their job, is that they would dig all the graves that came through for any of the burials at the cemetery. Eventually, um, he came back and was the sexton at that cemetery, at that Springville, uh, it was at the Evergreen Cemetery in Springville. And then eventually he was a sexton at the Spanish Fork Cemetery. How did you find out about your sister's passing? Chad called me the morning that she passed away. Do you recall what he told you? Um, he told me that she had been really sick and that um, she had been coughing all night and um, she had gotten up and with a coughing fit around midnight, one o'clock, and had gone back to sleep. And he was awakened by her that morning when she rolled out of bed dead. Did that make any sense to you? No, because I had just seen her two weeks previous to that, and she hadn't been that. She wasn't that sick at all. She was very healthy. Did she indicate to you any activities that she was participating in? <laughs> yeah, uh, she was in a clogging class, and she was showing us um, some of her clogging moves, but she was also preparing to run um, a you know, smaller race in their town, so she was trying to stay fit uh, and healthy. And how old was she? She wasn't 50 yet. We were going to get ready to celebrate her 50th birthday. When she came to visit in October, was that a normal visit? No, it was out of the blue. Did anyone come with her? No, she came by herself, and that was unusual because Tammy didn't like to travel alone. Did she tell you why she came down to visit? Um, Chad told her that she needed to come visit her family. Was she able to see all of the siblings? Um, no, it was me and my mom and dad. Did Tammy ever indicate to you that she had suspicion that Chad was having an affair? No, she never said anything about it. I don't. If she did have any inkling, I think he probably brushed it away. Did you notice any change in Chad and Tammy's relationship? Uh, yes, they stayed with us um, the first week in June of 2019, and. Um, it, something seemed off. Um, they were very awkward at our house, and I and Chad wouldn't converse with my husband um, like they normally do. It just seemed really strange, and we weren't sure what was going on. Were there any other ins instances where things seemed a little off? Yes, in my birthday in July, um, Tammy showed up at my front door to give me my birthday present. Um, I didn't even know they were in town, and he stayed in the car the whole time with it running. So she literally stood in my house for five minutes to talk, and then they just left. And he didn't even bother to come in and say anything. It was really weird. And that was of 2019? Yes. 
had you and Chad had any kind of a falling out? No. And Your Honor, I I'm noticing the time, so. All right. Well, I appreciate that, Miss Blake. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, uh, we need to break for the day so we can continue with the testimony of this witness tomorrow. That's fine. All right. Thank you, Counselor. That will conclude trial for today then. We'll start back, as I mentioned, tomorrow at 8.30 and plan on running a schedule until 1.30 with a shortened break time. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as we break for the day again, please uh, continue to follow the admonishment to not talk to each other or anyone else about this case. Don't do any investigation. Don't follow it on the news. Don't look into it in any way so you can maintain your impartiality. And we appreciate you doing that every day. So that will conclude trial for this afternoon. So we'll go ahead and uh, break for the day. All right, please.